Shaman Durek, my man, what's happening? Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. It's really funny. This happens a lot, but when I invite someone over that I'm friends with, such as you, we're, re- we're new, newly made friends, we'll start having so much fun and talking about so much cool stuff and doing all kinds of crazy shit without the mics on. And every single time, I'm like, God, next time someone comes over, I'm going to hand them the mic. I'm going to put the mic on their head, start recording. And we could have had like a two-hour show before we even sit down and say, hey, welcome to the show. <laughs> yeah, completely. So for those of you listening, uh, Shaman Durek just treated my friend Elliot to a full-on shamanic healing situation. There was just absolute madness going on in our living room slash studio here tonight. So we're, we got to talk about what just happened, but... Before we get into that, uh, tell people a little about yourself. What, what's your elevator pitch? My elevator pitch. Um, I'm a shaman to the people. Um, my family comes from Africa, from Ghana. And my mother's um, side of the family is Norwegian and from Tuscura Native American culture. And I have been, uh, how do you say, initiated into shamanism when I was about five years old. But I didn't start training until I was about 11. Yada, yada, yada. Took my rites of passage and died. Went to the hospital when I was 28 years old. Died, went to the other side. Had to put my body back together as a rites of passage. Because every shaman has to have something like rip them apart and take them apart. So they can actually like bring themselves back together with all the training and knowledge that they've gardenered. But that's not, that is like the story. And to me, a story is just not really necessary. What it's really about is what I'm doing in the world and why I'm here. And so why I'm here on the planet, why I chose to come back is to put the power back in people's hands, to pull back the layers of nonsense that people have been buying into, getting into this whole idea of victim consciousness and using victimness to be able to be empowered and really getting out of that state and changing the way we operate on planet Earth, on this beautiful Earth ship that we're on coming out of this space of, you know, we don't need to use suffering and pain as a way to evolve anymore. And, you know, me teaching people shamanic knowledge and giving them um, information and ancient tools that are brought forth with the knowledge that I have of those tools and then utilizing it within the frames of psychology, understanding of anatomy, understanding of kinesiology, understanding of how we adapt as human beings and then utilizing that information to how do you bring that into your life and make it work right now. Because I'm not into like, you know, okay, past lives and all this kind of stuff. It's great, but you're already having difficulty dealing with this past life. Why do you want to focus on the other one? You know? <laughs> that's what I'm talking about, dude. I'm like the no-nonsense shaman. <laughs> well, like. that's like the thing when people, like some of, you know, I love people uh, sticking up for other humans and activism and all that. Like I have respect for that, but oftentimes I wonder like, do you even know how to get along with your own mom and dad? <laughs> like, let's not maybe start solving all the world's problems until you get your own shit together. You know, getting your own house in order. You know? I, I agree. 100%. And I've thought about that when people get really caught up in the psychic world and the past lives and uh, astral projection and all this. And I'm like, dude, how about just get your car registered and then we'll go from there. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> I think it's just like, you know, um, uh, you know, simple hacks for adaptation on planet Earth right. is really coming down to kind of removing the nonsense and, you know, all of the fluff and like really coming into like what's really necessary for us to be able to 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 survive and be able to thrive as a species, not just with ourselves, but with the animal kingdom and with the natural kingdom and create um, a collective of information and data that's from the stream of acceptance, not from the idea of you're different from me, so I can't listen to you, but like really creating a social engagement where we're sharing ideas, even though we may not believe 100% in them, it sh- we should never shut ourselves off to new information. And I think that what happens is, you know, every time people meet me, they're always asking me like, oh, you're a shaman, you're, you know, and your grandmother was a medicine woman. And like, you know, you, this is who you are. Do you deal with ayahuasca? Are you dealing with boga? Are you dealing with these things? And I'm a spirit shaman. And so a lot of people don't even know what a spirit shaman is. They assume that every shaman is exactly the same and they're not. There are shamans, like for instance, I know how to do water shamanism. There in Bali, there's a lot of water shamans. So they work with water and they work with these certain ancient symbols that they infuse in water to create these experiences. When it touch the water hits you, you go through a shamanic experience and life changing experiences where there's like in Africa, there's certain shamans who are fire shamans. And so they build fires and they work around that. And there's shamans in Africa who don't deal with fire. They're earth shamans sim- similar to Aborigine culture where they'll bury you in the earth and do earth medicine on you. So, you know, there's all of these different things and we shouldn't just kind of like bottle them up into like one bottle and say like, this is what 
what shamanism is because a lot of times people have this really kind of obscure idea that shamanism is only from Peru and Native American culture. There's shamans that exist in Nordic culture. There's shamans that exist in Mongolian culture. There's shamans that exist in African culture, Hawaiian culture, Tahitian culture. I mean, the list goes on. I mean, on. What, about, what about even the medieval Merlin and all that? I mean, the alchemist even, right, is a certain sort of type of well, shamanism. shamans actually became alchemists. That's how medicine was formed because we were uh, the ones engaging with the plants and learning how to understand their association to the to our bodies and to the natural environment of our bodies because our bodies are living organisms and and shamanism the first thing we learn is that everything is living everything is life and so therefore we should honor it respect it and see it as a spirit and give it re honor and respect not just a human being who can talk but you know we formulate the understanding of human nature human beings have this kind of arrogant position where they think that like because they speak um, you know their language they think their language is more superior for more superior than an animal but it's like if you go to learn French and you go to learn Italian well how about learning how to speak to animals how about speaking to trees how about speaking to nature because they all communicate and most people don't even know that trees see you like they're the synthesis of information that travels between mother trees and tr in the tree network as well as fungi is so much more more like brought together than what we are actually experiencing as human beings so uh, I'm just going to let the audience know right now whether they be watching on youtube instagram facebook or listening to the final pretty edited version of this podcast this is going to be a an absolutely non-linear conversation <laughs> <laughs> like I, I it's funny though usually i have an outline but today i was running around and shit and you know we were just gonna hang it was, and i was like ah let me, I, I, I almost hate to do this but I was like, I shouldn't turn like a buddy hang into like, we're making content and then we have to be on and stuff like that. But I kind of made a decision today to not prep anything and just kind of pretend like we're just hanging out anyway and let the audience participate in that. But there's so many things to unpack in everything you just said. It's going to be tempting for me to like interrupt you and go, whoa, 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 back up 40 steps here. Let's, let's unpack that. And that just happened. Thought I had, and this was something I thought about asking you earlier. So you're on this new... Uh, eating regimen. You've dropped 30 pounds in 30 days. You look fantastic. Last Thanks. time I saw you, you know, I was big. You're a little bigger. No, I wasn't a little bigger. And, I was uh, big. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, there's, and hey, listen, there's no shame in that. I don't, I always tell people, whatever body you want to have, have it, own it. But if you haven't found a way to love it, then change it. You know, if you can't love what yeah, you got. Yeah, yeah. Me, I got a little gut. I don't, I really don't like it. It bothers me, but it doesn't bother me enough to work out really hard. Um, but I wanted to ask you about what you're eating because I was making a delicious grass-fed steak tonight. I knew that was what I was going to have for dinner. My buddy Elliot's here, and it's a little too much for me to eat, so I was going to split it with him. And when you were coming, I was going to ask you if you wanted some, and I thought, oh, I don't know if he eats meat. And then I got into this whole mind trip of, like, hunter-gatherer people, you know, going back through antiquity, pre-agriculture even, 10 to 12,000 years ago. And then hunter-gatherers, you know, there's maybe a couple of them left, but not many. Uh, typically would hunt and gather, right? So they're eating all types of creatures. But in the spiritual world of now, there's a huge movement toward veganism and plant-based diets and stuff. And I get the sense, um, having been someone that's been into spirituality and health and different diets and things and was a vegetarian for 10 years, that many people view uh, eating meat as something unspiritual. And to me... Uh, the shaman traditions <laughs> come out of the hunter gatherers and no one seems to get pissed at like native Americans for eating buffaloes. Like they don't think, Oh, those guys were assholes or in the, you know, Amazonian jungle or in the plains of Africa when they're killing animals to eat them. Uh, people that are new agey and think that we should all be vegans don't seem to have a problem with native peoples eating up all the creatures. What's your view from the shaman perspective on the cycle of life and, you know, energy changing from one form to another and all that trip. Okay. So the new ages to me are the new stagers, but it, we'll, go, we'll go, that's a whole nother thing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So basically I'm not, my, this is my, this is whole, my whole theory, right? If we look at the understanding of how we're adapting as human beings on planet earth and how they were adapting at the time, things were very different. Like for instance, the, the diet that I'm on, and I don't even call it a diet, I call it a lifestyle. The lifestyle that I live is an OMAD lifestyle. An OMAD lifestyle basically means that I'm in alignment with my body's needs. I'm not in alignment with what people tell me my body needs. Or the, or the USDA food pyramid? Yeah, yeah, I'm not into <laughs> eat that. Eat 10 pounds of grains per day. <laughs> yeah, eat three meals a day. Right. So the, the, the body itself is this amazing, intelligent, 
powerful living organism. Every um, organ in my body is a spirit that belonged to the elemental kingdom that chose to be my liver, chose to be my kidney, chose to be my heart, the whole bit. And it's intelligent. And so it knows more than I do. Like every microbe, every type of fungi, every type of bacteria in my body is way smarter than me of, of what is necessary for my body. And so it, know, it has its own system. And so for me, like eating three meals a day doesn't support me because my body is constantly in digestion. And when I communicate to my body and I ask my digestive system, do you want to digest food all day long? And it says, no, I want to be able to focus on this, these cells in your brain that I haven't been able to clear up. Or I want to be able to, you know, to work on this tissue that you tore when you were, you know, doing this um, athletic sport that we haven't been able to heal completely. So it, it, you know, it, it communicates to me and tells me. And so I'm like, what do you need? And it says, I need a break. I need you to get to, to let me be able to focus the energy where it needs to go to be able to alleviate these I've had a these couple places. girlfriends tell me that same thing, oddly. Yeah, so that, so that is one. And so for me, doing the OMAD where I eat one meal a day, which is exactly like how the Buddha used to eat, is that you don't need that much food to survive. We use food as a, as a how do we say, a coping mechanism for boredom, for emotions, for the idea that we think we should be eating when in fact we just really are dehydrated and we need water. And so that for me right there just kind of changes the whole mole- my, my whole molecular structure of how I, I integrate with this world is that I I don't need to follow what other people tell me to do. Now, going back into the whole idea of shamanism versus like, you know, the hunter and gatherer. One, for me, I don't eat meat. And it's not, I don't tell people that they shouldn't eat meat. I'm not here to tell anyone to do anything. Like everyone has their own experience on their life, on this sojourn of being on this earth ship that's traveling through space. And they decide what's right for them. For me, I can't eat meat because I have a very high level of sensorium. So my level of sensorium is so high. I can literally, if I was to eat a meat, like right now, if you were to go in the kitchen and grab a steak and have me eat it, I would be able to backtrack every single place where that until that animal was in its original form to when it was slaughtered, to where it ended up, to how it was on a truck, to where it got to, to everything, to it got into my body. The death hormone that goes into my body has a synthesis of informational codes that my body reads and then matches its frequency and then begins to release my own death hormone to to match it so that I can digest it through both my energetic system, my um, material system, my emotional system, and the way I process information. Some people who don't have an, an, an awareness in their sensorium or an awareness of synthesis or how their subtle energy field works. What's, they, sen- what's sensorium? Sensorium is the ability to sense that everything is giving off data and information oh, okay. and energy. So like, for instance, a, matrix a, a, type shit, seeing ones and zeros and sort of that holographic that's, So universe. that's the codes okay. of energy frequency. Okay. So like a code of energy frequency has those frequencies in it. That gives you the ability. So like, for instance, um, I also have friends who we can play music. And or if someone is making noise, I can see uh, synesthesia, which is I can see colors off of sound. But that's because I've tuned my ability and my processing ability to be set hypersensitive to energy frequencies because I'm a spirit shaman. So I need to be able to feel the nuances that happen within the universe so I can make changes to the adaptation of how I'm bringing information to people and being able to support them in their healing and, and you know, vice versa. Meat, for instance, for me, brings the death energy inside my body. My body wants life. So when it gets that experience of death, it has to transmute it. The time that it takes to transmute the meat death hormone in my body, I could be using that energy to be having a deep conversation with my ancestors or traveling to other parts of the universe through sound and vibration to meet with other beings and gain new information about things that I can bring to earth to help support people. But going back to the whole hunter and gatherer situation, at the time that people were hunting and gathering, they were in a survival mode for the idea that they're not going to have food every single day. So the amount of food that they needed to be able to hunt and gather had to be substantial enough to handle a tribe. They didn't know if they were going to migrate or if they were going to move the tribe or if they were going to you know, not have food for a period of a week, a month three days. And so when they hunted and gathered, they used everything, you know? And in shamanism, we have this word. I was explaining it to a friend of mine tonight, and this is how we live our lives. It's called take what's given. So we take what's given to us, right? And we utilize it to the fullest that we can because we don't, we have to be appreciative of all the energies that are being given to us. So in tribal culture, you know, yes, it was very um, apparent that they had to take and hunt animals and eat and stuff because they didn't know how much their body 
was going to be able to eat away the fat in the, their own body system for how long their body would be able to adapt and, and survive under those conditions. And they were very difficult, different conditions to we are today. But today we have grocery stores, we have fast food restaurants, we have restaurants, we have you know all types of things where we have refrigerators where we can actually store food and put them in there. We don't need to consume that much. If you feel you need meat and you need protein and, that's, and you're not willing to look at the amino acid chains of how you can actually create a substantial amount of protein in your body by following amino acids, then sure, go ahead and eat meat. But you don't need to eat meat like five times a week. The body doesn't need that. And also, if you look at an animal in nature, like a carnivore, and you look at their um, their digestive system, it's very different from ours. Yes, they have intestines. Yes, they have a stomach. Yes, they have the whole process of elimination and so forth. But they have an acid that's different from the acid of our own body. Our body secretes an acid that is not the same that a lion secretes. The acid that a lion secretes actually turns the meat that they eat into liquid. Our acid does not do that. So our the, the body... It starts to uh, it creates the the meat doesn't get broken down into the soluble that is necessary for the body to eliminate it quickly because it has to go through this long chain of intestines. Whereas an animal's intestines is like a lion's intestines goes like this, doop doop out. Whereas our intestines goes and then it goes around to the backside and it comes all the way out through the colon and then goes down to the donium and then all of a sudden the rectus um, um, releases from the rectus. And there, that is a long transition of muscle contractions that needs to happen in order for you to digest it. So think about it in the sense that if you're going to eat meat, just be aware of the, the like, you know, the, the moderation. I think everything is about balance and moderation. Yeah. So you're doing basically what a biohacker would call intermittent fasting, which is what I do. But the I found because I was like I said I was a vegetarian for ten years and I was in horrendous health and I thought I was being healthy, uh, but it just it didn't work for my body right. And then I started getting on a more high fat diet, and I found coconut oil, ghee, stuff like that, and and uh, grass fed butter and bulletproof coffee and whatnot, like we were talking about. I'm sure Dave Asprey will give you some next week when you go up there, or whatever. Right. Um, well, if, unless you don't eat grass, then then I don't know your your SOL. But <laughs> when I start, but when I started eating a lot of fats, I was like, I'm like, why is everyone so obsessed with food? Because when I was a vegetarian, I was eating all these carbs and fruits and sugary things and crackers and grains and bread and all this shit. And I was starving all the time. And then when I started getting like good fat, especially in the morning, I just stopped eating. And now today, today I, I barely ate anything all day. The first meal I had was actually that half of a New York steak. And I'm so full. I put some ghee on it. I'm good. Like I won't need to eat anything till uh, probably 5 p.m. tomorrow, you know? Mm -hmm. So um, – Unless I have that drug need for food, as you were describing, where there's an emotion comes up of some kind, whether it be positive or negative, and I'm like, oops, a feeling, where's some sugar, or you know, something yeah. like that. So when you were uh, 30 pounds more heavy, do you think that was a result of um, eating the wrong foods or just eating emotionally, or how did you get yourself into that position? I think it was eating socially, to be oh, honest. Okay, <laughs> following everyone else's kind of... I mean, my like lifestyle consists of like meets and greets, dinners with this person, dinners with that person, you know, going and doing all of this publicity stuff. I'm always going to some kind of gala, some this thing, that thing that it's always about. It's always surrounded around dinner. Yeah. You know, and it's like everyone's like, oh, I'll meet you for lunch. Oh, I'll meet you for breakfast. Oh, I'll meet you for this. Oh, I'll meet you for dinner. It's like. Okay, and so for me, it was like <laughs> you got to hang out with me more, bro. I'll be like, meet me at the float tank. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I mean, when you meet wrote me at the ice bath, <laughs> those are the options I give I my friends. It. It's never like you want to go eat. That's what I love about Iceland because in Iceland, that's the way they operate. They don't go to have meetings in uh, in uh, you know cafes and, and restaurants. They go to the, um, the the ice baths. They go to the hot pools. They go yeah, to the thermal yeah. the thermal pools, and, yeah. and that's where they have their meetings. But yeah, exactly what you're saying, and that's what I love about you as well too, because like you'll send me a message and be like, hey, let's go to the river today and just like lay naked in the cold ice water, you know, which I'm totally down for. All of these things, like the social engagements of eating became very a part of my life. And I realized when I actually asked my body, I'm like, I'm not happy with my body. 
I, I, people started coming up to me and rubbing my stomach like I was the Buddha. It was not pleasant. Oh, man. I had one kid put their hand on my stomach <laughs> and go like, a lot of groceries, huh? Oh, you know, shit. And kids tell the truth, and I love kids because yeah. they're, they're so transparent if about it. If a kid it. starts telling you Santa Claus, you might want to take a look at your You got to do something about program, it. You got to yeah. do it, yeah. And, I, and then some people would write me and be like, I want the shaman to be big. I want the shaman to be voluptuously big. And I just... I, I don't want that because I don't feel good in my body. And so I asked my spirits, you know, people started talking about intermittent fasting, which you just mentioned. And I asked my spirits, is it for me? And they said, no, there's something else. And you need to go online and we'll tell you when. And then I, in the middle of the night, I got up. They're like, go online. If you're ready, we're ready to show you. And immediately I got online. This thing, Omod, popped up. Wow. I, read, I went through the videos and I heard this complete message in my being, like, that is your path. Where are you getting the amino acids from? Like, what do you eat if you're not eating? Do you eat ghee or, like, any animal products at all or just I no do meat? No, so I do, I do um, avocados and things okay. like that. And I look for, like, a lot of different amino acids. But um, I don't need a lot of protein in my body, uh -huh. whereas some people do. And it's actually really funny because I'm actually getting this um, DNA test done from a friend of mine who's this amazing um, uh, nutritionist. And she's got this new technique where they can read your 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 family's ancestry i don't feel the need to consume a lot of protein in okay. my body but some people feel that they do and so i eat as according to my body tells me to eat i, I, I what i do is i pre-plan all my meals by having a meditation in the middle of my day and i ask my body what do you need right now to continue having energy to be strong, to have muscle, to do this. And literally, I get a piece of paper and I start writing down everything my, I, that it's telling me and I write it down and I look at it and then I go and get it. You know what my buddy tells me when I ask it that? Hmm. He says, you need Twizzlers and fried chicken. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm just playing. But I know you are. It's, you know, but that's, that's great discernment is like being able to tell what's the mind and what's that, that, egoic sense of running away and masking emotions and trying to hide in food because i you know i'm a thin guy but i still have a propensity for all types of addiction but that comes from fear because if your ego was aligned in love you wouldn't be running around and masking and doing these things you operate when you are in love with yourself you operate from this place of peer nurturing of the self like literally like when a woman comes to me and she says you know I want to have, I had a, um, a pregnancy and um, it went really bad and the, the umbilical cord got wrapped around my baby's neck and, you know, shaman, I don't want to go, my husband wants another baby and she starts crying to me in my arms and I hold her and, you know, and she tells me I want to have a healthy pregnancy. I go, here's what we're going to do. Grab a piece of paper and write on the top of the paper what I need for a healthy pregnancy and just keep writing and writing and writing and writing and then don't stop until you feel like you've gotten everything out. And when she reads it, she's like, what, in, walks, walks in the park with my man once a week? Like, that's a part of me having a healthy pregnancy i'm like yeah you see we're born into a world where we're not asked what we need we're told what to do immediately upon coming to earth we're not asked like hey uh what is the thing that would really inspire you right now is this working out for you right now do you feel good about this test that you're taking no we're told these are the rules obey them if you don't this is what it means you're going to get in trouble you're going to get grounded you're going to get punished you're going to get you know whatever and if you do this you get rewarded and we even antiquate santa claus in the exact same way it's like oh yeah santa claus rewards the good and gives everyone who doesn't have a good year a lump of coal and then we antiquate god in the same way it's like oh if God, if you do everything that God wants you to do, you're going to have an amazing life. And so everyone tries to strive to be this perfection of what they think is perfect when they don't have the right understanding of how creation works and how the human body works and how life works as a general. And so for me, being put into this system on earth when I came here in this embodiment and watching how the, the human consciousness bases everything on a ruling system of between like do what is supposed to be done and if not, this is what it means – I'm a renegade. I am the black sheep. I am the one who's like, I'm sorry, but your rules um, on your ways and your, uh, you, you know, whatever you're saying that you feel that I should do may be right for you, but is not right for me. And I was my dad's worst nightmare because literally I check in with my needs. And like we weren't asked what our needs are. So that has become a blind spot in our in our lives people don't really know like people will always come and ask me like what should i be doing in my life like you already know what you should be doing but because you have been taught never to be asked what you should be doing you won't look at that blind spot and just go right to it and writing down on a piece of paper what you need i literally 
kid you not, it literally changes your entire life and your perspective of life because need is an emergency. Like I need to have water, I will die. I need to have sunlight, I will die. I need to have these things, I will die. And so this is a need, it's an urgency. And literally on earth, if you look at the earth itself, and I always tell this to people all the time, it's like the sun, the moon, the rain, the, the wind, everything in nature is constantly pouring into us to give us what it knows we need in order to survive. But then we don't pour into ourselves or into other people to give them what they need to survive. We restrain, we, we, you know, we, we restrain, we hold on, we, 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 we hoard, and we, and we think that we're going to survive as a species and by acting in this way. Humans don't even know. I can go to a person on the street and ask them, what do you think your body needs right now? And they'll have no clue because they're not connecting into sensorium. They're not connecting back to the part of themselves that needs to know. And this, this is, yeah. And this is, uh, I, I think what I was getting at in terms of food, the place that I've arrived and I'm joking about the Twizzlers and yeah, stuff. Yeah, I Although I do get food cravings that are really dumb. Sometimes I try not to follow them, but I think we can develop discernment right about uh what is a, a real need or a want like holy shit like you said i'm just dehydrated if i don't have the ability to really ask my body like hey body meat suit which is its own to me it's its own living thing that's almost like separate from me in a sense right it's like body what do you want <laughs> you know it's my soul talking to it but then if that animal body's just getting what it wants right then that's where those cravings come from so the difference between like a craving and an actual need is is different and there's a discernment there that i'm assuming from your perspective if you know if i'm not paraphrasing you too much is that that discernment then also starts to operate in other areas of your life so what do i need from a relationship what do i need in a career what do i need uh in in relation to my family what do i need to have, to have money in my life what do i need to be successful what do i need to have optimum health what do i need to be lit every single day what do i need in order to survive in a way that is easy and effortless for my spirit instead of making everything hard and difficult and when you and when you're asking that to me when i kind of ask that it's really me asking God. It's sort of, you know, I, I live as much as I can from a place of surrender where I, I always feel weird about using the word God. I have to get over that shit because to me, there just is a God, period. I, there's nothing to argue about. But some people get triggered by that word because they, they think you're talking about religion or something. And I don't want people to miss out on the experience. I have this like codependent sort of thing where I'm like, oh, God, if I use the word God, then people won't have the experience of but God. But it's not your responsibility. Be, it's thank not you. your responsibility to decide how someone perceives the, your information and how they perceive your work. I appreciate that. So... When I want to know what I want and what I need, the, like the way I frame it, and I want to see how this fits in with your worldview or the way that you do it personally, it's like, so say I have a certain type of relationship that I want, as we were talking about earlier, I've taken a long break from all things romance, right? And I'm really getting to know myself and feeling really good about that. Let's get rid of want and need. Let's go to your need. What do okay. you need for, for you to have a successful, happy relationship? I need to be able to have a relationship with myself first. Great. At which I'm, which I'm building. But how I would frame that, it's always in me, it's always in relation to God. So it's like, God, I, I think I need this. This is what I'm sensing that I need or that I want. Could this be your will? And, and I'm learning the more that I trust that universal intelligence in my life that some of my ideas and plans and what I think are my wants or needs ends up end up being very shallow and short-sighted. And the more I surrender, whatever God has in store for me is infinitely more interesting and beneficial than whatever my little idea was at the time. Let's Although there are times where my little idea, quote unquote, little idea is fucking awesome. And God's like, yes, green light, go, we're giving you that. That's what you're supposed to be doing. Like the podcast that we're on right now. Right. So let's use, I, I want to go back to something you said about what God want, what God's will for you is. So like when I died and went to the other side, what I learned about what God's will for us is, is for us to be happy. That's it. It's not as 
convoluted or as you know uh, complicated that we human beings like to be in order to feel like we're smart and educated and have some kind of understanding of creation. Creation is very simple. And you know the greatest way you can understand creation is to communicate to God within you, which is your inner child. Your inner child, which you call your, which is the soul, is God playing as your inner child to see if you will have a relationship with God through having a relationship with yourself. Because the greatest way for you to learn about God is to learn about what God created. And that is with you. So that's why all of us have the soul. My soul that's in me is the same soul that's inside of you. It's just playing differently in me than it's playing differently in you. If you were to talk to that little boy inside of you and ask it to tell you the truth of who it really is, you would find out that that little boy is only taking what you say and creating as you speak or think. So if you say, I'm an idiot, then God has to make you an idiot and will change your brain chemistry and change the way you perceive the world to make sure that you actually get to the idea that you're an idiot because you are the creator. You create your reality. You create the universe. And the reason why, you know, everything that you see in this universe was dreamed of by other beings at another time and we now get to experience their dream. What we dream now will become the new worlds that will be created in the universe and that throughout the galaxy. And we're dreaming it into existence by every choice we make as a collective and as an individual. So your perception of the understanding of God is held into an idea that God is thinking independently. God is thinking quantumly is not operating in the ideas of human consensus. It's operating on the understanding of that which is bringing you to the highest place of your experience. So if for you, something that is going to be the most authentic and most loving and most nurturing and most easy thing for you, that's God. If it's hard, if you're struggling, you're pushing, you're grinding, you're, you know, as I tell everyone, it's alignment over hustle. If you're hustling, (laughs) right, then... That's not God. That's you. That's you operating from fear in order for you to get into the grind because you think that's what you have to do instead of just sit back like I do and I just simply talk things into existence. I simply say, right now someone is thinking something beautiful about me. Right now someone just did. Right now someone is thinking about something they want to do with me that's going to open up us to be able to create more messages and more joy on the planet. All of a sudden that gets created instantly. God is listening from within and listens to exactly what you say and then brings it into formation. I told this woman once she was talking to her daughter, the daughter was going to go to Guatemala and I was at her house and she said, you know, I'm, you know, I'm, I, I'm just worried that my daughter's going to go to Guatemala and someone's going to try to kidnap her. I said, you just cursed your daughter. When only two weeks ago we had a conversation about Haiti and the first thing came out of your mouth was all that voodoo and cursing and all that stuff and that mojo stuff. I don't want to have anything to do with it, but you just did it just now. So even though you didn't cut off the head of a chicken or do some kind of ritual dance and and, and put a blood on your head and and, and curse someone, you cursed them already. (laughs) Yeah, that's like that's like uh, I love the saying and I don't know who came up with it, but it's so true that worrying is praying for what you don't want. Yeah. Right, it's exactly. that kind of thing. It, it, I, I really work on that. It's it's almost like uh, a self NLP. I really do my best to avoid using the word hate. Oh, I hate it when that happens. I hate traffic. I hate this. Then what am I? I'm hateful. I, and being hateful feels like shit. Well, that's what your devotion and being, is. And being self deprecating, mm-hmm. something I'm really working on. Like part of my let's sen- change the word from working on. <clears throat> To I have been moving through it and gaining great clarity and understanding of how to move through the process in the most enlightening way. Because when you I can't use the remember word, all that, bro. <laughs> okay, take it down to something simple, easy. Think of it, it. Just use instead of using the word "I'm working on it." Yeah. When you say that, your spirit sees it as this ongoing process instead right. of you actually simply deciding. See, I was thinking that was an upgrade over "I'm trying" because I, I don't like using the word "try" because that doesn't mean you're doing it. That means you're trying and trying is not doing i i've i have that in a visceral way so that's another one of those but i like that working on it is whack too so give us a simple so a simple way so instead of saying i'm working on it it's been amazing how i've been processing the information to accepting it as a part of my life right i love that i got a random question for you yeah because i'm just gonna fucking be random Random's great. This is the I love way, random. It's the way our communication goes. But you were talking about a soul coming. I don't know where this comes from, but it's something that I ponder, I think, because I have friends that are now getting married and you know getting closer to having kids and stuff. And when you're talking about a soul coming into existence through a human body, and this might come from uh, you know, a shaman point of view or not, but what do you think about circumcising boys? I honestly think it sucks. It's fucked up, right? My dad did it, and I said, you leave my dick alone. 
Yeah. Like I, if I like if if he didn't get the message before, he should have got it, but he wasn't tuned in because I probably was screaming at him. But literally, I I accept that it happened. And I move on. Do I forgive him for it? Absolutely not. Because forgiveness traps you in duality anyway. So there's no point in forgiving anybody. The point is... is Because there's no need to forgive them because there's nothing to be forgiven for because they did it out of innocence. Yeah. And then the idea of forgive... Well, forgiveness... Think of it like this. When you go into the idea of forgiveness, right? You you make one right and you make one wrong. The moment you do that, you have tied yourself to what is called a duality chain. A duality chain means that the forces of the universe, because there's there's a wrong and there's a, uh, a right puts you together in duality and therefore you both begin to suffer through all time as long as that is held in that frame. So when you go into acceptance, you accept the situation, therefore each party is free and able to move about as they as they please. Right. I will never forgive my stepmom or my dad or anything, but I accept what they did and therefore they are truly forgiven. Because I'm not held to that to that to that pain anymore. It is now yeah. lifted. Right? It's like a pre for it's like a pre forgiveness because there's no there's no accusation to be forgiven. <laughs> You're not making the accusation. It just is what is. It just is. I mean, yeah, yeah it's that's like, cool. Yeah, I like I like that because there's also there's bait in the identification with oh, I'm such a great person. I'm able to forgive these people that have wronged me. But yeah. on a deeper level, out of duality, as you're saying, there's no need for forgiveness because. Is it is what it is, right? Right, and the matrix, the, the the matrix or the system wants us to stay in this, um, in this, uh, this, uh, you know, this separatism, this idea of, you know, deci- uh, divisiveness, so that we can completely, um create that world of duality so we can constantly stay in a state of conflict and co- and and not really engaging as a community as a connection so people can constantly say like well you know this is where i'm at that's where you're at so it's more of the me versus the we and we have to get into the we and in order to get into any we consciousness you have to remove the things that keep you in that me which is duality duality as a state of you know it's like it's like uh you know um Really understanding the the way the universe is operating is not placing your judgment upon it and your idea. Because people say, well, you have to judge. No, you observe and you can discern what is happening. But to judge is to make one right and one wrong or to make something right or wrong. And therefore, you are trapped in a perception that may not even be yours, that could be passed down through a generation of people who just didn't understand something. And so in order to feel safe, they chose to judge it and label it and say, this is what it is and then you've accepted that label and along with every attachment that goes with it i'm going to jump back to circumcision yes i'm obsessed with this concept okay i believe that mutilating the genitals of a child is wrong and we've accepted not even that long ago i think it was like the early 70s female gen- mutilation gen- uh, female genital mutilation became illegal in the united states i could have the date wrong but i honestly i think it was like the early 70s mm. like you could cut clits off little girls and it was like all cool but now <clears throat> i find that disgusting now we're still um, now we're still now we're still doing that to boys and mm-hmm. it's something that i i want to talk about and i'm going to find like the the best expert on it and do a fucking show on it because it's my belief that the toxic masculine that we experience in today's world is that that's partly responsible for it. I and my I, like my friend Daniel Vitalis says, you, if you don't want guys to act like insensitive dicks out in the world, stop cutting theirs off. That's a good one. I like <laughs> right? that. That's brilliant. You know, cause that's really good because all of the all the manifestations of. You know, what, just to, for lack of a better term, just bad behavior. I mean, just of being an awful person in the world are usually a result of trauma. Hurt people hurt people. And, and I think back to, you know, myself being however many days old when they put me under the knife like that. Um, that's, that can't be good. I mean, I have dick FOMO. <laughs> I do. I really do. I'm not going to be, I'm Dude, not going to say that I don't. We were, I talking, we were do. talking about your book earlier. And I, while you were talking earlier, you have so many euphemisms. We need to make like the Shaman Durek dictionary that's sort of like new age <laughs> slang, alternative languaging. I, I'm seriously need to write this shit down. Uh, but for, for parents or parents to be listening, you know, I, I, it, I and I'll close on this. It's, I don't want to have a show about it now. I will in the future, as I said. But I think some these are some of those things that we don't really talk about or most people just take for granted until you start to unplug from the matrix and go, well, wait, why do we even do that? 
And if you ask someone that, I asked someone that the other day who was thinking about having kids. I'm like, oh, it's germs and this yeah, and that. I'm like, same thing. what are you talking? What? Where's the proof for that? that There's is no total, factual evidence. That is total bullshit. Yeah, it's all. The human I mean, animal is done just fine. Uh, you know, and I'm sure there was things where there were, uh, you know, syphilis and, you know, all this crazy, you know, STDs back in the day or whatever. But generally speaking, humans have done just fine with their God-given wedding tackle coming out just like God made it. I mean, there's a whole there's a whole idea of... Because I asked my dad, my father um, was uncircumcised and he circumcised me. And I was just like, I was perplexed. Because one day I saw him naked and I was like, something's off. Why did you cut me and you didn't cut yourself? Like why, if you didn't get cut, why did you think it was okay to cut me? And he's like, well, because it keeps you cleaner. And I go, well, why? He goes, because you have to pull this skin back. And he was explaining it to me. And I was like, so you think that I'm not able as a human being to be aware of my own hygienic responsibilities to pull the skin back and take care of myself that you decided to take it upon yourself with your own arrogance to decide that you were going to take my skin off of my amazing, powerful, wonderful, magical gift, (laughs) (laughs) you know, and do as you want with it. And think that it doesn't. And you're have like some... you're like eight having this conversation with you. Oh, I was a kid. Yeah, I was a teenager. <laughs> I saw him when I was like I was really young. I was maybe like twelve years old, and um and he didn't know what to say. He he because he he realized in that moment that he was wrong, and it and I was like, Jed, it's not. I'm not here to like make you this bad person. I just want you to think more. Like just think. You know, that's the problem that I find in in society is that people just do things because the train t- because they heard about the trend that you know this is what happens in religion or this is what we're supposed to do because we're Jewish or this is what we're supposed to do this but think about the human nature of a human being and like I always say you know you don't have the right to make that decision for me like you don't have the right to do that and that's the thing that I always find very fascinating about parenting because parents really think that they have the right to do as they want with their child. And I think that they really need to take a little bit more uh, understanding of responsibility of the fact that this is another spirit. This is another uh, being that has come to earth. They don't, you do not own them and you do not have children because it makes you look good because everyone else in the magazines are showing their hot little kids with all the celebrities and now everybody wants to have a baby because it's, it's the new Kids are cool. like an accessory it's a on new Instagram accessory. now. <laughs> yes, it is. It's an accessory. Look at my kid with a new hat. Look uh, at my kid with a shirt. Look at my kid with the booty. Oh my God, my kid's wearing spiked shoes. Okay, great. You don't have the right to do that to your child because you feel like this is going to make you feel better. If you want to bring a child in this world, you need to realize you're bringing a, a being in this world to usher them with the tribe to help them become what they've come to become, not because of what you think they should become. And we have a lot to learn in that department. And that's a whole nother, uh, uh, you know, podcast because I have a very strong view about that. And I, I work in a lot of Muslim countries. I work in Israel. I work in countries where people have this kind of very, like, very strong view about these things. And I, I, I lay it down. I lay it down. Oh, my God. I just had a really interesting question be born out of uh, something you just said. So you do a lot of women's empowerment work. Yes. And I, and I want to find out about that. And I was curious. Again, an idea crossed my mind today. And you've lived in Turkey. You've been in uh, Muslim culture a lot. How do you reconcile, um, you know, like, and this is not a political show. I'm fucking scared to even ask this question. But it's an interesting point to me that I've yeah. observed culturally. <coughs> I do not get involved politically. It's not something I'm, I feel qualified to really get activated in. I do my work on a spirit level one by one or listener by listener. But I have found it inter- interesting that, like, in the feminist movement. Why do you use a resume to express yourself? There's no need for it. Just be, just like say what you're going to say. Well, you, it's because we live in a PC culture, dude, in Hollywood. We live in a, a commun, a, almost a communist fascist culture here. Wait, shake up to wake up, baby. And That's you, what I say. You, shake I up mean, to I wake feel up. like someone could be waiting for me outside my fucking house ready to kill me for saying something that hurt their You don't feelings. need to say that. You don't need to give power to that. I'm going to start carrying a fucking gun. I'm Second you Amendment, You see what I say in some of these countries. Here, here, here's what I'm curious about is I... You know, I see a lot of the, you know, I'm not talking about like valid feminism, which I think quite obviously I'm a proponent of. And if not, let's just say that I love women of, uh, you know, all walks of life. 
was raised by a really great one who was an ardent feminist, born and raised in Berkeley, California in the 1960s. I get it. But I see a lot of, um, you know, anger toward men and like man hating. But I don't see a lot of that hate going toward the Muslim culture and the more radical aspects of it that from where I'm sitting, t treat women like shit. Like I just read something yesterday in, um, I think it was Saudi Arabia. You know, it's obviously like a really big deal that women were able to drive. I was like, wait, what the fuck are you guys talking about? And then the other one was like, they can't open a bank account until unless they get permission from their steward man and they can't travel. Or their brother. Or they can't brother. travel freely. And I'm like, where are the fucking feminists now? Like you guys should be at the embassy a fucking Saudi Arabian embassy protesting that shit. It's weird. So, but again, it's not my battle and I don't really understand it fully, but from your perspective, having, you know, lived in Muslim countries and doing women's work, how the fuck does that work? So I'm, that's bringing up emotions for me. So I'm just going to get into these emotions that I'm feeling that's coming up for me. Um, one of the things that really affects me is the idea that, you know, when we look at it from the um, this point of view, from when you're looking at it from being in America, you're not understanding the family structure, okay. right? And in a lot of those countries, and I'm going to get emotional, here it comes. In a lot of those countries, it's based upon a certain level of respect and a certain level of respect for the parents and a certain level of respect for your elders. And the traditions are very strong because they're a devotional people. Muslim, I love Muslim people. I love Israeli people. I love people who are devotional. But what one of the things that I do a lot in my work is really engage uh, the conversation because women do care. They are, they do, it does bother them in those countries. The difficulty is that they have to build these underground movements to be able to get other women. I'm to, talking about the women here in the West. Why aren't oh, they rising the, okay. up against this The shit? women in the West have a very different viewpoint, okay? You have to understand, this is actually interesting that you said that because during the whole women's march, you know, women were talking about like, you know, women's rights, women's rights and so forth. And one of my friends called me um, from Africa and said to me, isn't it interesting how the women in America are talking about women's rights we're just trying to be able not to get our clits cut off and like <laughs> that's what I'm saying, you know, bro. and get our, our vaginas mutilated. Right. And they're talking about women's rights. I'm I'm trying to protect my vagina, you know. And the thing is, it's a difference between culture. It's a difference in understanding. You know, women's rights are different from here than it is from there. And what we have to do is create a conversation. And a lot of the women in America don't spend a lot of their time with the women in those in those cultures. So you think it's just a lack of awareness? It's not that they wouldn't be fighting against that or spending their energy trying to you know help uh, you know the women's movement in iraq where like i think there's a lot of uh, there's a, a huge group Ira of women iran that i know is, in iran america is what i was thinking of there's yeah. like this uprising now and and i can understand why the movements don't gain much traction there because you'll be imprisoned or killed but but that's the risk that you take for humanity i mean right. i say things in countries i've been many times you know can, putting myself in a very situation with erdogan and the things that come out of my mouth in the book that i wrote in turkey you know i got a lot of slack from people, you know, backlash from people who are religious about how dare I as American, as arrogant they thought I was to write a book for Turkey and talk about things in the Quran. And so I had to actually go through with my team and like literally take things out that like sexual things, things that they just were not, that they knew I would be sitting in prison for seven years, you know, right. and really facing prison as, you know, I remember when I first decided to write a book in Muslim culture. The first thing that came up was no one's going to publish you because you're American. Two, what you're saying is really racy and you're, wish, you're, you're, you're risking yourself to be in prison. And I used to get people writing me letters like, wait till I see you in the street. I'm going to shoot you in the head. I'm going to crack a bottle over your head. And, like, you know, and I had to really like just process these, de these people threatening me all the time and making comments to me and saying things to me and, you know, and really just keeping my focus on why I'm on this planet Earth. And... I honestly believe that a lot of women in America, the reason why they haven't made a huge movement is because they have fears. A lot, why is, what, like, here's a perfect question, and, I, and this is something that I bring up a lot when I'm speaking around the world. Where are all the leaders that we used to have back when? Why aren't people coming out and being like the next Martin Luther King, the next Mandela, the next whatever? Because every history that they have of those leaders ended up in some form of being shot, 
murdered, thrown in prison, whatever. So people are really sedentary, of fear, afraid of stepping out of their comfort zone and saying, I'm going to be a radical truth speaker and speak and stand for things. And there's recently the person who got killed in Brazil, you know, all these different things. And for me, every time I'm traveling these countries, I mean, I was supposed to head to Qatar and my trip got canceled because the women were bringing me there to, to be a part of their underground movement and to help them. And some of their brothers and their family members found out and they were like, oh, no, no, he's going to come here and do what? Like they, and so they had to cancel the trip. You know, there was all these different, and I've been, off, I've been offered to come to Iran, and, I, and people have set up like, you know, speakeasies for me to speak in. The thing is, is that I risk every time I walk into a place, I'm risking that someone is going to come and blow my head off or, you know, or I'm going to come face to face with ISIS. I mean, you know, it's real, you know, but yeah. the thing is, I live in a way that if I have to die for my message, so be it. Yeah. Well, I, I, I guess I wish more people were like that. And you're an inspiration to me. You know, even though the scope of my work isn't within the political realm, there are questions that just come to mind like that today. And and I was I, I was thinking this too. I was like, imagine if just you know, I was born in 1970 in Denver, and for my entire life here, I was told that when I leave the house, I have to wear some kind of cover on my head. I mean, I'd be like, fuck you. I'd be leaving the house with a machine gun every day, just like mowing people down that tried to fucking stop me from wearing my bald head or whatever. You know what I mean? You it's mean just, for women covering themselves yeah, up? Yeah, yeah. Well, let me give I mean, you I'm some information like, about that, because that's I'm not like, what you think it is. I'm like, I just don't believe in anyone being forced to do something against their will but they're not being forced just against their will just for the covering you have to understand the covering came from the wealthy the the how do you say the wealthy royal families when the when the women would go into town they were uh, they wore uh, uh, the wrap upon their head and covered their head and stuff so everyone knew who they that this is who they are and this is they were like you know seen and acknowledged and protected women started to revolt and say, well, how come we don't have the same protection? So then it was elected that they would cover themselves as well. This is where the, the, the tradition of it comes oh, from. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, it's not just put the cover on your head because we want to cover you up. They, of course, that kind of migrated into that behavior where men are like, "You, I should only have my eyes upon you. And so a lot of women in those countries, because I'm friends with a lot of women who cover themselves up. My friend used to call them ninjas because they, they go underneath and they, you, know, you just see their eyes. <laughs> right. Like I, my friend, I took my friend to, and, and he's like, oh, there's the ninjas. I'm like, oh, my God, I can't believe you're saying that. Oh, we're seeing the restaurant. There's the ninjas. I'm like, and I started laughing at one point. But I understand that in their mindset, okay, because I have friends who do do that. And they do it out of respect for themselves and, and their husbands. Um, they don't they, – they like the sacredness of the idea that their man only sees their beauty. Their man only sees the beauty of, of their beings. Because underneath those things, they are decked out. I have a girlfriend who wears the covering on and when we when you know she we hang out she's like Gucci and all her dope clothes and they have these parties where they show off you know their amazing outfits and all these things they live in a very devotional and reverent way to their culture the thing I don't think anything is wrong with that if the woman is agreeing to that but the thing is that what people think is they think, think oh those women are being forced there are some women who don't want to do that and then they should be able not to have to do that. But the women who are like, this is what I want. I want to live this life with my husband. I want to stick to my traditions. I want to honor these things. We shouldn't be passing judgment upon it. Oh, no. Fuck no. But we should understand <clears throat> where it comes from and the understanding yeah, of well, that, it. Well, that's interesting. I mean, you know, and of course, my point of view is very limited because what's available here in the media, you know, I just, I see some women in Iran that are getting sent to prison because they don't want to wear that's the thing I'm not into. I'm like, I'm not into what that. the fuck is it's 2018, bro? Like, seriously, they don't look at it like that. I mean, that is ah, that's hard. And it's unfortunate because a, I mean, women are not allowed to surf. They're not allowed to ride a motorcycle. Well, that's I mean, that's kind of I'm I'm old school punk rock. dude. like I just posted something on Instagram a couple of days ago and people are like, oh, were you into Depeche Mode? I was like, Depeche Mode? What? No, dude. Sex Pistols. Exploited. I like, like Sex Pistols. <laughs> Black Mine's Flag. It's punk rock. AC, you guys DC, got the haircut all wrong. Pantera. That but that's, was all mine. that's where I, that's like, that's, you know, when I was a youth, I was like, 
people should never impose their will on other people. I uh, agree. You know, I mean, obviously, if someone's harming others and they're a pedophile, a murderer, a rapist, robber, go to fucking jail. You know, they get put away. And I'm sorry, you're an animal. You're going to get locked up like one. But for someone just expressing themselves in whatever way they want. And when I was a kid, you know, I mean, I always dyed my hair, wore makeup. I had earrings. Now that doesn't mean shit. But back in early 80s, I mean, you'd get your ass kicked if you had one earring in a kind of a normal. I was there. I did it. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So it's like, I think I still have that. And I'm like, how fucking dare you tell someone what to wear or not wear? <laughs> yeah. You know? Um, anyway, I digress. I totally not planning on no it's going fine and that, i think people should know i mean i i it's love inter- it's interesting for you because you know as i said a lot of your work is women's empowerment but you also have like a lot of um you've done a lot of work with muslims and i'm like oh how does that mash together that's just an interesting well, i concept. mean i can tell you why in, in in this sense is um you know for me it's about creating social engagement, social connection, people understanding each other from their different points of view and their different ways that they live their lives and their customs and so forth. I am a love being. I've always been a love being since I was a little boy. I love people. I don't care what race you are. I don't care how you speak. I don't care what you wear or how you operate. I love people. I even love the people who are not in harmony because they need the love the most. And so for me being a love being, I used to always, you know, when I used to, people used to read me stories about Christ and like what Christ was like and so forth like that. And I was like, I get him. I get him. Even though I, I'm trained in shamanism, I also studied world religion. And one of the things that I loved about religion was not the things that you're not supposed to do or God's going to strike you down because I've proved all those things and God didn't strike anybody down. The thing is, I love the, the, the understanding of how Christ lived, which was a place of love, a place of devotion, and a place of healing people and being of service to people and loving them unconditionally. And I've worked with people in Juarez. I've worked with people in prison. I've worked with mafia bosses in Turkey. I've sit down with people who would like blow a person's head away in a second and engage conversations with them and put my arms around them and have them cry in my arms because they weren't always like that. They that that was entrained into them as human beings because of certain things that happen in their life. So for me, I'm all about loving all cultures and finding ways to bridge culture together by educating people, by helping them understand things and getting them to look at it's not about the country you come from, the race that you are or the language you speak and the food that you eat and the person you're you're choosing to share your body with, be it if it's a male or a male or female or female or a man who is a female or whatever it is, these labels do not apply to spirit. It's about us together living and living and accepting and thriving on planet Earth in a way that makes it so that we can live our lives, you know, in harmony with each other. I appreciate that, especially in in our current state of uh identity politics and all this like we're i think being programmed a lot as a culture by the media to take sides and and all of this division it really comes from watching the news i think if people stopped watching the fucking news we'd all be getting along uh, a lot better Just like stop hating trump stop, stop hating people who voted for trump you shouldn't you that, that i literally say to people that you're creating a form of bigotry by saying that you can't stand someone because they made a choice about something they believe in in intellectually. That is, in its sense, basically saying that anything that's different from what I believe that doesn't go with my beliefs, I can't love and accept, and we're never going to be able to heal this planet that way. Yeah, I mean, that's fascism is what that is. Yeah. There's a lot of it going on. Uh, But anyway, there's other things I want to talk about. Yeah, okay. Uh, We just glazed over the fact that you died, went to the other side, (laughs) came back with a story to tell you, like, oh, yeah, and then the one time I died, blah, 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 blah. I'm like, no, 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 no. Rewind the tape. That's a rewinding tape. Bring me back to that moment. What happened? What was that experience like? Because I am fascinated by this phenomenon, especially for the people that hold the point of view that you are this meat suit, and when the heart stops beating, you're gone. Yeah, and whatever. I don't believe that's true. Based I mean, that's on, proven science. Based yeah. on so many people like you that stood above the body and was like, oh, wow, there was that body I used to be in. Now I'm floating here listening to everyone. And So what was that like for you? Yeah, and by the way, I love that thing that you did. It reminded me of Willy Wonka, like when he's like, rewind, fast forward, rewind. <laughs> I've never I'm done like, that before. I'm the biggest kid, so I love, I love all that stuff. Spontaneous. Um, and, then, and then even people like, you know, I love Asian. I have such a respect for atheists because I love the fact that they actually think that, you know, they could have this body and they're just going to leave. But then they're like, oh, yeah, but I believe in science. And I'm like, oh, you believe in science. 
do you believe in quarks and nodes? Do you believe in the fact that there are energies that blink in and out of existence out of your body and turn up in some other place? And science still hasn't been able to track where those energies and how they jump back into the body. But that's a whole nother take. Well, there are, I, I don't believe there are atheists because they believe in not believing. That's the whole point. Exactly. <laughs> you st- everyone believes in something. They believe in their point of view and that's their God. Exactly. Just, exactly. Yeah, anyway. I love that. So I just wanted to throw that in because I, I, I always have fun with that. Uh, 28 years old. I was, uh, where was I at the time? So, you know, throughout my um, experience and, um, and my training and, and, and my travels and so forth and becoming Shaman Durek, I was told by many elders from Lakota tribes, you know, from African tribes, from Mongolian tribes, you know, from Hawaiian shamans and many different mystics and teachers and so forth that um, I am a spirit shaman and that I've come to earth to bring in new intelligence. And so I was going to have to physically die. And some of them would just say, I'm going to die. And I remember one time I was doing a sweat lodge with a Lakota and Running Bear said to me, one of the elders, he said, you, when I was in there, he's like, your Jaguar spirit came out and spoke to me and told me that you're going to die. And I was like, oh, okay. You know, when you hear that you're going to die, it kind of becomes this like, I'm going to have a spiritual death. You know, like I'm just going to have this kind of big awakening, this big aha like moment. Like an ego death or something. Yeah, some ego death or whatever. But literally... I was in London at one time, and I was being coerced by these uh, very secret society, Illuminati-type people, and I met this guy named John Marsis, and John said, you should come to Greece and do this hypnotherapy with me. So I'm like, I'm not really into hypnotherapy. However, I'll go and you know be open to it. And I went, and he put me on this table, and he took this watch in front of all his class, all his students, and he waved it. And then I was like, "Look, nothing happened." And he's like, "Really?" And he pushed this tape recorder, and he's like, "Actually, it did." Oh and shit! And the tape recorder was basically was me talking with a very feminine voice, and it said that I was the that it said that. I need to go to Delphi. I've never heard of Delphi in my entire life. It told me that I was, the, it said that I was the Oracle of Delphi and that I need to return to my sisters and return to Delphi. He immediately was like, my parents want you to spend a night. So I went to spend a night at his family's country house. That morning at four o'clock, they took me out of bed. They drove me to Delphi. I had no idea. The whole time I slept, I couldn't even open Where my eyes. Where is Delphi? It's, it's in Greece. It's up in the mountains. Oh, okay, okay. So I got there and immediately, you know, fast forwarding, I got there and when I got there, they want to get a tour guide and the tour guide was going to come and tell us where everything is. And the moment I got there, I saw my whole body transform into a female. I knew where everything was. I knew everything. And I told the tour guide, I've been here before. She goes, have you been on this tour before? I go, no, I used to be here. I was the Oracle of Delphi. She goes, really? And I said, yes. And I can tell you where everything is that you're going to point out. And she was like, what's over there? I go, that's where the cattle used to come in. And that's where the slaves that would, people would bring their slaves would sleep. This is where the guy would blow the trumpet. This is where people would wash their feet. And I just like laid it out for her. So I got there. I took my friend on the journey, got to where, uh, where the Oracle used to be. There was this glowing energy of light and spirits moving inside this kind of like sphere, what I realized was a stargate. And these women were talking to me and they were like, sister, we need to show you what is to come. So I was like, okay. And I was going to start crying because it's like my whole body's in chills right now. Literally, they said to me, you are going to die when you turn 28 years old, the most horrible and painful death. You will, you will not have an ability to stop it unless you make the choice three to four years before. I, you know, got messages about everything. They laid out every certain aspect of certain portions of my life that I needed to be aware of. They told me that, um, that, I, that, I, have to, that I have to die because I need to understand um, the understanding that people have about death and I need to be able to go meet with the spirits and to meet with all of myself that I've lived and all the spirits that I want that made me be who I am. Because in, sh- in shamanism, we don't have a belief in past lives. We have a belief that the spirit, uh, like for instance, in one of my lifetimes, or my, the spirit that was in that lifetime is Amun Ra, created me in this lifetime, but also created other people in this lifetime. So there's other people who believe they were a past life as Amun Ra, but we all were inside of that body. Oh, trippy. This, see, this is the thing that's always trippy. And, and hold the placeholder, please. Don't <laughs> fuck this story up and go on a tangent. Either one of us, I'm talking to myself. This is what always trips me out of past lives. Like I, I'm on board. I, I view it as there's just one life that has no beginning and no end, and each little human lifetime, like the one I'm in right now, is just a blip. It's like a scene in a long fucking movie that 
has no beginning and no end. And that's kind of my, you know, sort of understanding uh, based on intuition. But what trips me out about people that get really deep in the past life stuff is everyone was Napoleon or fucking <laughs> Queen Elizabeth. Or, you know, it's like no one was just like, oh, I was a janitor. I cleaned out the shit house in ancient, you know, Rome or whatever. It's always something And they significant. probably were. They just don't have their... It's always something significant. Part. And I'm always like, okay, why do you have to be special? You know, so... But from what you just said, that's interesting. So there might be a fountainhead sort of energetic persona that's then offshooting kind of like, you know, incarnation, bukkake the universe. You got it. Okay. Yeah. Did I so just put really, those words together? Sorry. Yeah. I no, but I you did. did it really well. And the thing is, is that this is actually my first life, but the spirits that made me have lived throughout different existences, even the ones that are me, because I have an angelic spirit that made me. I have an ET spirit that made me. I have an, uh, an emperor. I have a woman who was a, a slave uh, concubine to the, um, to the, to the Zing dynasty, to, um, to the emperor. I, you know, I was a, uh, I was a spirit guide at one time to a boy who died in a car crash and a bunch of other people. Cause when I was a spirit guide, I was spirit guide to like 500 or more people. Like I was dealing with like the quantum aspects of all these different beings on earth. But the thing is, is that going back to what I was saying is that when they, you know, they told this to me, I heard it. And then later on, as time came on, I kept getting dreams where they're like, you have to make a decision if you're going to take this full step into this place because you're running out of time. And I kept hearing it. I would meet with those shamans. They're like, do you know that you can change what's going to happen, but you have to make a decision soon? Because if you don't, if you meet, if you go past a certain place, there's nothing you're going to be able to do to, to change the, the, what's, where you're heading. And when I was working in Belize, I was re- meeting with two shamans. One was a medicine woman in, in the islands of Tobacco Keys, and the other one was in Jaguar Jungle, where I was spending my time with two shaman um, men. And we would go out with a machete during the day and be in the jungle and stuff and everything. And they were talking to me, and they said, you know, I see, I see that you've made a decision of death in this lifetime. That means that you have really made a decision to make a, 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 a you know, a, 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 how do you say, an offering to humanity. And shamanism, shamans have to either lose their eyesight or have some kind of illness that happens, that they go through a death ceremony. And the reason why, because it's been passed down through, it's like us paying our dues, or paying our dues for the powers that we get we get inhabited, we, we get. So I always, can always tell when I meet a shaman, I always ask them what's your rites of passage. And if they can't tell me, I'm just like, okay, dude, you're practicing, you're giving out medicine, but you're not really uh, committed to the path of the shaman because you don't, it's not a side hustle. You know, it's like, it's your life. I live, eat, sleep, breathe, being Shaman Durek. And so when I was told that, I was like, okay. And then the woman in, uh, said to me, when you come out, when you leave the jungle, you're going to die. And so the day I left the jungle, I was 28 years old. I went home and within like three days, I woke up. There was a spirit in my room. I was on my bed. It looked at me and it said, are you willing to sacrifice something for what you're asking for? And I was like, yes. All of a sudden, I felt this pain in my back, like this burning sensation. I got up. I went to the kitchen. I fell down. I was on the floor. I thought I was like, I don't know what was happening to me. I was hyperventilating. My body was in so much pain. I felt like fire all over my body. I went and grabbed the phone by pulling the cord off of my table, and the phone fell down. I dialed my friend Marcus. My friend Marcus came in his truck. He grabbed me, picked me up off the floor, put me in his truck. He drove, I think, four blocks, and I felt my whole body starting to shake inside, and my head just smashed into the windshield, smashed into his dashboard, and my head kept banging the dashboard. And I'll never forget, like, my head just kept banging the dashboard, and then I, was, I woke up in an ambulance, and the ambulance told me that I had, like, eight rolling seizures. And I've never had a seizure in my life, so I was like, oh, that's what a seizure feels like? And he's like, what? What are you saying? And I was like, well, I've never had one before. So it's quite an an interesting earthly experience to have a a seizure. And he goes, that's really weird. No one's ever said that. And I was like, am I planning on having others? He goes, you could. That's why you have the padding right now on the side of the stretcher. And I go, where are we going? He goes, we're taking you to Hollywood Presbyterian. So he... They take me in. Marcus shows up. They didn't have any room, so they left me. So this was here? Yeah. After you got back from Belize. Right. Okay. And they rolled me in. And as they rolled me in, Marcus came over and he like held my hands and he was like, 
don't worry, the doctor's going to be there for you, we're going to get you through this, and so forth. And as he was talking, his mouth started going, and I heard this high-pitched sound. I'm going to start crying. Hold on a sec. There's this high-pitched sound. And the room turned to like like liquid. Everything morphed into silence. And there was a woman, and she's beautiful, glowing, luminescent, not moving her mouth. And she said to me, if you fight, you will go through pain. We're here to make this process as easy as possible. You must surrender away from this body. You have to let go of the body. Don't fight. And I said, why? And she said, the time is coming and we are here to guide you to the place where you need to go. Um, If you fight, you will go through pain and we're here to support you. And so everything just went. And then Marcus was talking again where he left off. And he was like, are you okay? And I'm like, why? And he's like, you were just staring like a blank stare. I don't know what I was talking to you. And you just zoned out for a second. Are you okay? I go, Marcus, I'm going to die. I go, I'm going to die. I'm going to die. I'm going to die. He goes, no, you're not. No, you're not. I'm going to go get someone right now. We're going to get, we're going to figure this out. You're not going to die. I go, Marcus, please don't leave me. I don't want to die alone. He grabbed my hand, and I remember feeling his hand, the warmth of his hand. I, like, grabbed him really hard. I was squeezing his hand, and he goes, are you okay? I said, Marcus, do not leave me. I am going to die. He goes, how do you know? I said, they just told me. They said it's going to happen within a couple of minutes. It could happen any second. I just don't want to die alone. That has been my biggest fear. He goes, you don't have to die alone. I'm going to be right by your side. All of a sudden, I felt fire rushing through my body. I felt every part of my body starting to vibrate in the most painful way. I felt like someone was taking a knife and carving through every part of my body. I started screaming on the top of my lungs. Um, Literally, the, the pain became so unbearable that I started to try to like grab my body and I started going into a seizure and Marcus tried to put his hand on my chest to stop me. I felt my throat close and I couldn't breathe. So I started banging my throat as hard as I could. And um, I was making this sound, like a mm sound. I couldn't get any air and Marcus was screaming for help and I could feel this pain in my chest I could feel my eyes pushing out of my lids. I felt my fingers, like everything was getting numb in my body. They came, they poked a hole in my throat. That's why you'll see like marks, I have marks on my chest because they poked a hole and they couldn't get any air. And they started putting this thing, this blue thing they were squeezing on my face. They grabbed the stretcher, they started rolling me. As they rolled me, I felt my body pull away and come back in, pull away and come back in as if I was seeing an echo of myself where I was to where I was being taken. The pain became so unbearable because I couldn't breathe. I felt my eye sockets burning and I could feel that I could hear them saying, we're losing him, we're losing him. And all of a sudden, I heard this voice of this woman say to me, let go, child of light, let go. You don't have to hold on to this body, let go. And I was screaming in my head, I changed my mind. I'm scared. I don't want to die. I'm scared. Please make it stop. Please. I'm so scared. I can't do this. I changed my mind. I don't want this past. I changed my mind. And the voice said, you have already put this into motion. We can't stop it now. It must complete. You have to let go. And I remember... I started losing 
consciousness the pain was so much they were holding me down my body was convulsing my eyes were pushing my eyes into my sockets because my eyes were popping out and literally I got to a point where the pain was so unbearable I just let go I just couldn't do it anymore I just the pain was so much I just couldn't I was like I remember the moment the pain was so unbearable I said there's no there's no human way I can take this pain anymore it was like the worst pain that I ever felt in my entire life and I've gone through a lot in my life and I've felt a lot of pain and then nothing described this pain what that was I happening felt. to you medically like what was the pain so my body from? filled up with uh, so my kidneys stopped and my body filled up with potassium and so the burning and everything was the potassium in my body my potassium went up to a 10.6 so every organ was shutting down one by one until it got to my heart. And that's why the pain was so unbearable because I could actually feel my body shutting down one by one. Every organ, my stomach, the you know, my liver, everything started shutting down until it got to my, my respiratory, my lungs collapsed. And my respiratory, my muscles stopped moving and my body started going into shock and the pain was my body fighting to live. And that's what was causing this intense pain. And uh, I let go. And when I let go, I saw them pulling me with this, like, like pulling me to some medical hospital room. All of a sudden, I saw my everything turn to liquid, like I was on the bottom of a pool with the light glimmering from on top of the pool but it was all around me and I remember taking my my hand and going like this in front and it was like waves of liquid and like colors and I looked around and I realized that I was not even in that hand I was actually experiencing echoes of my consciousness experiencing itself I could hear what they were talking about. I could see myself on the stretcher. I could see what was going on in the hospital. I could see and hear other patients. I could experience every single nuance of every experience that was happening to the point where all of a sudden I was in that space for a moment and then it kind of just zoned in and my grandmother was in front of me and my aunt was in front of me and they were like, we were waiting for you to acknowledge us. And I stood there in front of my grandmother and my aunt. And I'm like, what happened? What's happening right now? And they're like, you're fine. Everything is going to be okay. They're like, there's one more thing that you are going to go through. But know that you may think you're alone, but you're not. We're all with you. We're always with you. And all of a sudden, I was in this, the... The, the echoes started moving me and then all of a sudden I like evaporated and I was in this kind of black liquidy substance with lights and colors I've never seen before and sounds I've never heard before and then all of a sudden I was standing in a hospital room watching my mother give birth to me and I was inside her stomach experiencing the birth all at one time and I watched and then I saw myself get birthed and I felt myself go through the birthing. At the same time, I felt it, the blackness and all those colors was me inside her womb and then I was outside her womb and then I was experiencing her emotions. I was experiencing the doctor's emotions. I was experiencing everything and then it went from that and then it went to the next one and to the next one and to the next one all the way up to every single thing I've ever did in my life. Every person I ever spoke to, how they felt, what they did with the energy, how they received the information I gave them. Everything just spread it out like all around the world, everywhere, I could feel every mark, every energy that I've ever created and all the way to the point of me being back in the hospital again and watching myself. And I was like at peace with it. And I just immediately went from like, it wasn't like, it wasn't this kind of like, uh, you know, something is wrong anymore. It was like, yes, I get it. Like I, I was at peace and all of a sudden this beautiful light surrounded me and I went into this light and I could hear the voices talking to me in this very strange like, you know, whisperings of lots of whisperings and I entered into this um, look like a sunrise or a beach and it all of a sudden I saw ocean water and I saw mountains and I saw all these beautiful grass and trees and I looked but I didn't see any hands and 
I remember seeing all of this scenery from different angles. And then this woman showed up and she said to me, what body would you like to have? And I, and she didn't speak to me with, with her mouth moving. She just spoke into my, like we were one, like we were one consciousness. And I said, the body that I once had, and all of a sudden my hands appeared. And then I touched my hands, but I didn't feel bones. And I didn't feel hot and cold sensations. I felt this perfect warm energy that was vibrating this essence off of me. And I remember reaching down and touching the sand and doing this with my fingers and being like, this feels so good. And like everything was like, I'm getting chills again. Everything feels so good. And everything um, just made sense to me. I could hear sounds. I, I, I could feel every type of pleasure. Like the way I described it to my doctor later on, because he was asking me about it, I said, it's like having the best conversation with the most amazing friend, the best lovemaking you've ever done, the best food you've ever eaten, the best view you've ever seen, the best everything, all wrapped, your best, your favorite blanket when you're cold, all wrapped up into this essence that is just there. And it didn't go away. And she said to me, um, she said, you know, there is no time here. So, you know, feel free to do as you please. And I know you have questions. When you're ready, let me know. And I said, I do have questions. Why do people suffer on earth? Why is there pain? Why is there sickness? Why is there war? Why is there, I like, it was like almost like my consciousness needed to have all those answers met before I could fully emerge myself into this place that I was. Every single thing came out in my consciousness and it ended up with the answer. And the answer was malfunction in thinking. It wasn't like this long, drawn out thing that was told to me. It was just all suffering comes from malfunction in thinking. Malfunction in thinking. And as soon as it came to me, I was like, yes. Like, it wasn't like I debated it or argued it. It was just a complete acceptance. I knew it was true. And then we, she asked me, do you want to um, see family, friends, other friends that you, that you know or connect with? Would you like to go somewhere? What would you like? Would you like to rest? Would you like to eat? It was like all of these things given to me. And I was like, we can eat here? She goes, oh, yes, everything exists here. You, anything you want, you can have. And I was like, so anything? And she's like, everything. There is no rules here. She's like, what do you feel you want to do? And I said, I want to see other people. She goes, how would you like to get there? I said, uh, well, what ways can we go? And she said, you can, we can fly. We can, we can teleport there. We can just be there. We can glide. We can fly there as an, a bird, like whatever. She like, made, she like basically laid out. And in way, the way she spoke wasn't like the way I'm speaking to you. Take what I'm saying and speed it up so fast that all the information she gives you is in like one word. And literally, I was like, I want to glide there. And we were gliding over the grass. We were by the ocean. There was these beautiful mountains. And I was like, is this heaven? And she said, it is whatever you want it to be. And I thought that was interesting. And then she took me to this community area. And I saw all these like these beautiful lights and, and, and energies. And I said, what is that? And she said, that is the consciousness of every spirit merged to create this space to be perfect for everyone. So my consciousness was a part of it and every other spirit that was there was we were all collectively creating the most amazing pace for all of us to enjoy and we can step into our own place if we want to in that moment so it was like even though we were at this beautiful lake which is where we ended up I could leave that lake and immediately go to a place of an ocean and immediately be all by myself if I want to or be with tons of people if I want to or I could go and turn myself into an energy frequency it was the most amazing experience and I got to meet this little girl who told me how when she was on earth that she didn't get a chance to be a kid. That's why she chose to be a kid here. I met, you know, I got to see my family members. I got to see friends of mine. I have this one friend named Josh Yortz who I went to school with and I got to meet up with him. Um, I got to talk to, and, and they all had their own 
how do we say, if I was to give it to you in a way that I can express it in a physical way, imagine that you have your own world and another person has their own world and another person has their own world, but like take that world and multiply and make it expansive as the universe itself. And that's all yours to, to, to be in, experience, to create. If you want it to be tall buildings, it'll be tall buildings. If you want it to be ocean with dolphins everywhere, you can go and be with the dolphins and you can turn yourself to a dolphin. It was the most – I mean, I now because I've been through it, I don't have fear of death anymore because of it because I know what comes. And what I learned about was like when she showed me the earth – she didn't show me one earth. She showed me billions of earths. She showed me multiple, multiple. She said the universe is more than any human being can ever think it is. There are more species and beings and galaxies, and they're being created per every second of human time that's being created per the miller of second, not the second itself, but the millisecond before a second becomes a second vast billions amounts of universes are being created and it was amazing and what you know I, I i got to do all these things and she said to me um we have a message that you want to go back and i said i do want to go back and she said when you go back we need to show you what's going to happen to you and so she showed me all the different quantum levels of things that could happen to me based on my choices and uh, she asked me if I wanted to have my memory erased or again, or do I want to have it given? And I said, why did we erase our memory in the beginning? She said, because you are going into a place of space where darkness, uh, darkness inhabits that area dimension. In order for you to be able to bring light into that dimension, you have to accept the darkness. In order to accept the darkness, you must erase your memory of this place or you won't stay there. And so... Some beings elect to have their memories erased so they can fully delve into the experience of being on earth and accept all of its different realities. And I said, if I go back with my, um, and I'm just paraphrasing it because I didn't use the word if, but it was a different type of conversation, but I'm giving it to you how it would sound in this languaging. To go back to earth with memory, would that affect me? She said, you will, have the, you will have a part of your being that will vacillate between wanting to stay and wanting to go back home, and you're going to have to manage that. And so, and it's funny because I have been dealing with that. That's like when people say like, what is the struggle you have? Sometimes I go into these places like, do I really want to stay here and complete this, um, this love and gift that I could bring? Or do I just want to go back home and, 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 and chill and play and have fun like a big kid in the giant playground that, that it is on the other Create side. a fucking trillion dolphins. <laughs> you know? Yeah. <laughs> what the thought. Yeah. Well, I want to ask you something. <laughs> this, is, um, this is probably the longest period of silence that I've experienced as the host on my show out of 150 episodes or whatever it's been it's a fascinating uh experience to to hear about obviously but there's one thing that really grabbed me and that was your question which is the question why is there evil and why is there suffering and that your simple answer was malfunction and thinking i want to unpack that a little bit because to me uh that's already my experience. I've never had those words, but it's it's that I have a limited capacity at times to see the greater purpose in the suffering and that the dark is necessary for the light to exist. And it's my thinking that says that's wrong, that's evil, it shouldn't be that way. Why would God forsaken us poor humans in this way when we've actually asked for this experience in order to learn what there is to, to learn and to be able to experience that? So that's that's my kind of personal interpretation how did you unpack and how you how do you continue to unpack the darkness and evil that does exist and i think this is this is the atheist dilemma that if there is a god why would there be rape and poverty and war etc and and that's the big block that humans seem to have that well, they can't find the purpose in it and so they think it shouldn't be that way and that's the malfunction in thinking to me is arguing with reality right so what I was taught on the other side was that uh, this per area of the universe, so the darkness exists because in every, uh, the universe is multidimensional. So everything exists, everything exists. You know, if you're thinking unicorns, unicorns exist. They just exist in a different dimension. 
the reason why we have a sight of it because someone actually vi- went into that dimension with their spirit and and, and, and and then came back into their dimension and saw a vision of it and then started to draw it in books and storytelling and all this kind of stuff. But everything that you see uh, in storybooks and all these things that you see, vampires, all these things like that, they all exist. They're just existing in different dimensions and people have tapped into them. And that's what I found out. And so this dimension is held in, high, in, in, in a density. That means that the light frequency is not at the highest level. And if you actually go into religion and look at like the book of Genesis, it actually says, let there be light, which I find very fascinating because when I actually was able to get out of the wheelchair, like when I spent, especially when I was in the wheelchair and I was paralyzed, I spent a lot of time reading it's like, what else are you going to do? And then just roll yourself around the house. And I was living in a tree house, so it wasn't the greatest place to roll yourself around. Literally, the understanding of me, like, looking at the Kabbalah, looking at the Christianity, looking at the Quran, looking at all these different things, it actually says in a lot of dif- different texts in Aramaic language and in, in Kabbalah and also in, in the Bible, let there be light. In the beginning, um, there was the word and the word was God. And, and then, you know, um, God separated the firmament of the heavens and then the earth and said, let there be light. And then the light came upon the earth. Well, it's interesting because in what I learned on the other side was that this was a dark region of space, meaning that the density on the types of beings that were here were operating from um, an intelligence of darkness, which is to prey upon each other, right, out of this, this field of fear. And we brought light into this area of the universe. And through that created this, um, this, this explosion. And that explosion is why we have duality, right? And so we actually think that the darkness can't exist without the light, and that's not necessarily true. Mm, interesting. The beings that are in the underworld are the beings that are, are, were us. We, there are beings who came here as beings of light, but they fell into the darkness because we have to fall into the darkness in order to understand the darkness. So we erase, as they told me, we erase our memory. We take full understanding to coming here. We, we, we created an, uh, a schism within our, our mental process, which we call the ego to give us a form of attachment. That's why I call the ego the great paperweight. It's here to like lock us in. And what it does is if you get caught, um, the spirits that are in the underworld were once a human being, but when they lived their life, they were being affected by the beings in the underworld, uh, tapping into the algorithms of the way their brain works and speaking into their head and started taking actions based on those things that they heard. And so when they died and they, like I told you, you get to see your whole life and how you affected every single person on the planet. When you see your life and you realize that every person you affected on the planet and it was not coming from the place of love and you get to see what could have been because you get to see quantumly, some beings can't let go of that. So they go into the darkness. And this and, is your Jeffrey Dahmer like type situation. Yeah, they can't go into just beyond evil, just you're done. Like they just can't accept it. Because when you die, the the, the blinders get pulled off of your of your behavior as your character, of what you were living to who you really are. And when you actually see all the things that you did because you got pulled into the darkness and you let dark matter get into your thinking process and made choices that affected the lives of other people in this very like degrading, very painful and you know way, your spirit doesn't can't step into that. It's not because God is punishing you or your judgment day like a lot of people like to believe or all this stuff. It's because the light needs you to come in unencumbered. You have to let go of everything, full surrender to enter into the light because it's a different frequency. So your frequency can't pass into the light, not because God doesn't want you in it. God wants everyone in the light. It's because your frequency can't because it has a distortion. And so you have to be able to let go of that distortion. So the underworld is created. So the underworld... A lot of people go there in dream time. They'll see like a red sky or like they'll try to turn on a light in the underworld and it doesn't, the light doesn't turn on. You know you're in the underworld. Or you'll see like weird creatures moving around because the underworld takes on certain aspects of what we consider evil and dark and starts creating it. This is it. why I don't watch horror movies, bro. I don't want, I don't want to be energetically connected to any of that shit. <laughs> <laughs> My homies would be like, oh, dude, this movie's supposed to be really scary. Let's go see it. I'm like, why would you? There's enough scary shit in the real world. Why would I go watch a facsimile of scariness? Yeah, I tell people, if you want to see things that will make you just go on tour with me and see some of the things that I deal with, and you'll be like, I don't need to watch scary movies anymore because it's real. And like, I remember one time there was this movie. 
It was called, oh uh, dear, it was like a movie where a gypsy was cursing this man, cursing this person, and they put this coin on them. It's called Drag You to Hell. And a friend like, was like, please just watch it with me. And I, I, and I said, no. And then I sat down with them, and they were doing this, this gypsy thing in the film. And I go, do you know that's real? And he goes, what do you mean? I go, that is a real curse because I study gypsy lore and I've studied gypsy magic and that's a real curse. And we're being cursed. We, that energy is getting on our energy field. And I go, I got, I got to get out of this theater. I got to get out of here. I can't watch this with you. I'm sorry. If you want to be subjected to magical curses that are being incantated in a film that actually are affecting your energy field and putting holes in your aura that are allowing certain spirits to get in, enjoy. Not for me. However, I do not have a fear of the darkness because as a shaman – it is our, we came to earth to engage the darkness back into the light. The reason why we haven't been able to succeed at the level that we could is because darkness knows that that's why we're here. And darkness can't accept itself. So darkness's thing is to proliferate your mind with its own energy, consciousness, and make you do things that you can accept and then bring you into the darkness so that it can create its collective thought. The beings in the darkness, there's a lot of beings. When I go at nighttime and I travel to, excuse me, when I travel to the underworld, you don't have to edit that out. When I travel to the underworld, I go down and talk to beings who committed suicide, who couldn't accept, uh, who couldn't accept going into the light. There are some people who commit suicide who go to the light, and there's some who, who don't. I talk to soldiers who went to war, and when they died, they saw that what they, the people they killed, and they couldn't accept it, and they go to the underworld. So I go to help them to bring them to the light. So I, I'm like a counselor. Everyone knows me in the underworld, and every time I go down there, it's funny because the beings watch me, and I, they know I'm there because I – illuminate my own presence with lights because there's no lights that everything is dimmed down there and i go down i go look for people souls who haven't been able to forgive themselves or when i say accept not forgive in the sense of duality they haven't been able they can't accept that they that they killed someone in war they're still playing out the war sometimes i'll go in a battlefield and i'll see people still shooting cannons and things like that and then I'll look and see who's willing to be um, spoken to in a way that will lift them to consciousness. One of the films that I really loved that I saw that really connected with me was this film with Robin Williams called What Dreams May Come. Because there's this scene where he goes to uh, the underworld to find his wife who couldn't forgive herself for killing herself. And she was in, in hell. And his son said to him, if you stay down too long, you'll start to buy into her reality and you'll become a part of her hell. So get her out as quick as you can and the way he had to do it was to get her to wake up that she doesn't need to be in hell and that's the thing about the underworld is that those beings are down there or I say down because it's not really down it's actually kind of like in another dimension they don't some of them don't want to be there but they don't know how to get out and so as we here in what we call middle earth we here um, have the ability to, when we hear negative thoughts, we have to know that that negative thought is a being from the underworld reaching through us to tell their story. And instead, we think it's us. So we start acting out their story. And that's not what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to engage those thoughts. I call it loving interrogation. Engage those thoughts and be like, hey, why am I an idiot? I'm a being of love. How can I be an idiot? And then you engage it. Where are you coming from? Where is this voice coming from? And then it will tell you, I'm a spirit in the underworld. Then you have a choice to instead of judging them, hear them, and then guide them to like, like when people have spirits in their home, they're like, oh, I got to clean my house again. I go, why don't you just talk to the spirit? Obviously, it's there because it, it knows that something you can offer it to help it move along its journey. We're, we have to get out of this condemnation every time something's scary we have to run the other way that people have the nerve to call themselves love and light workers when the, the whole purpose of being a light worker is about dropping love and dropping the light that means anchor the vortice of light that means confront the darkness not run from it not be afraid of the thing because these shadow the darkness comes to every human being on earth when you're a child when you were a child the shadow beings came into your room they hid under your bed, they paid attention to what scared you, and they took on the shape and the form of that which would scare you so that you would never go into the unknown and you will always give them dominion over the earth. This is why human beings can't um, choose, and I say can't choose, but they can choose, but they choose not to, is because they still haven't dealt with that fear of their childhood when the darkness first confronted them. 
And that's why I love Metallica because Metallica as a kid really brought me to a great place of awakening. <laughs> that was, that was not the next sentence that I was expecting to come. <laughs> Dude, you fucking crack me up. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, because Metallica really brought the science for me as a kid. <laughs> so I used to sit with my big headphones and lock myself in this cabinet which had glass doors and my sister would come in and call my name and I was watching her the whole time and I was listening to Metallica. It was my church because I would listen to their songs and I go, oh my goodness, they see beyond the realm. I And I would write down their lyrics, Master of Puppets, you know, Enter, you know, um, Enter the Sandman. All of these things were real. And so I literally started telling my friends in school, like, you got to listen to Metallica. You got to listen to Metallica. That's why, I, I mean, people see me today. I wear Metallica t-shirts and kimonos, you know, it's because Metallica literally came together and got beyond the veil and was able to tell the story of what was really going on behind the veil. This is what's happening. And people don't want to face off. Like when I bring a room of people and I go, tell me about the beings that scared you when you were a kid. One woman said to me, oh, yeah, you know, I was walking down the hallway and I heard something call my name behind me. And I started running and I flicked on the light so I can get to my bedroom. Uh, you didn't bother to turn around and, and engage it? She's like, no, it just scared me as a kid. And that's why I don't ever want to deal with anything spiritual because I don't ever want that to happen to me again. I go, exactly. So they succeeded. They're, they're, the underworld being six, they're the ones who want to keep the underworld being what it is. They built this whole infrastructure by tapping into the minds of people on earth, getting them to build the cities a certain way, building the lights, building everything, technology, everything, so that we, and that's why, I, you know, you're talking about my women's empowerment. Women empowerment, the reason why I'm so strong about women empowerment is because women, you know, even scientists, even the Dalai Lama, everyone knows who is understanding of the way energy operates. Women are the ones who have the ability to shift the planet energetically through the darkness because the feminine energy knows the imbalance and the part that's not balanced. That's why men were weeded out of their feminine. That's why we were told that if we, if we cry, we're weak. If we don't show our strength, you know, we are told that men, b boys don't cry. We don't know how to emote emotions. Because if men could be devoid of their feminine energy, then they would find women as a threat and try to devoid them of their feminine energy. And then darkness would be able to continue to create things. And we would have no understanding of what's, what, what is creating an imbalance on our planet because we can't feel because feminine energy is, that, is what gives us the ability to feel when there's a disturbance in the frequency on planet earth have you ever seen the diagram of washington dc streets that creates the shape of a pentagram you ever no seen i that haven't shit? seen that when you're talking about you know how cities have been built using many of them the underworld energy and there's this whole sort of illuminati pulse going through the universe yeah dude there's an over i mean it's a real thing this isn't a conspiracy theory yeah if you overlay a pentagram over washington dc it fits the exact schematics of the streets there it is bananas there's so much weird shit like that in the world i mean there is i mean that's uh, why there's not enough parks when, and cities because when, when you when you say that you go there to this underworld and you spend time there and you're you know, <coughs> in, inviting souls out of that and, and doing your your light work is that like it, in a time in a day where you're doing a meditation or does this happen when you're dreaming like where are you physically and what are you doing when that happens and is do you make a decision okay you know what for the next hour i'm gonna like dip into this other dimension do my work and then i'll see you guys at five for dinner or you know how does it work <laughs> how does it work on a pragmatic level it's it, it depends okay i have a lot of friends in the spirit world so i will go visit a lot of them uh so sometimes i'll just lay on my bed and and i'll get a message during like something will happen like if i'm going about my day and i see like a bird fly by and it flies by again i know i'm getting a message from another dimension of a spirit friend of mine that needs my help so i'll go home i'll make sure i get all my stuff done i'll go home lay on the bed open up a portal and then transport myself through it to that world to help my friend for instance like i have a friend in a world that's in another dimension that needed me to, to gather certain things in this world that was going to give it energy in its world. So I'll, I'll help them because they help me. We help each other. That's like when you saw the work that I was doing on you today, the reason why I'm able to create those sensations in your body and to have the spirits pull those things through your being is because I'm, I'm a spirit shaman. So I'm friends with the spirits and I'm friends with the trees and I'm friends with the elemental spirits and I'm friends with the, you know all of the different uh, beings in other dimensions. And if I haven't been to that dimension, I don't go in 
into it with an arrogant behavior. I go into it with, you know, what planet am I in? How far, how, how far away from planet Earth have I traveled? What, you know, and, and then they take me through their world and talk to me and so forth and so on. A lot of times human beings think that the only way we can travel to, to other planets and, and, and meet other species is through a crafted third dimensional um spaceship what we're going to find out in the future is that there's going to be chambers that we go into that create high projection sound waves that literally put us to a to a place where our spirit will travel through that sound and we'll get transported through a stargate into another dimension this is how i i travel and so when when i'm doing that with a, for a friend i do it very like okay i'm going to go lay down Certain times at night, I will feel this tinging vibration of electricity all over my body. And I know that that means that I'm needed in the underworld. And, I, and it, it kind of, sometimes it's the underworld and sometimes it's the higher planes. It depends because I just let it take me. So in astral travel and OBE and out-of-body experiences, when, you start, when I train people how to learn how to travel and become what I call a soul navigator, which is a huge part of shamanism, a lot of human beings think the only way they can soul navigate is by taking some form of plant medicine and accessing. But a lot of times when people take ayahuasca or iboga or any of these plant medicines, they're just seeing the doorways of those dimensions, stargates opening up in front of them, but they don't know how to get into them. So they're like, oh my God, it's all these colors and it was whizzing around me and I felt this intense love and it was like all everything is love. Yes, but did you go into the dimension and meet the other beings who are setting, a, setting that, that gate to you to ask you to go through? And in most cases, they don't because they don't know how to do soul navigation. And so when, when I lay in bed and I feel my body going, like this intense vibration where I can feel my teeth turn to electricity, my body starts shaking, I know I'm about to have an OBE experience. That means that I'm being called somewhere. There's a honing beacon calling me for help. And so immediately I let go because let's face it, if anyone has done out-of-body experiences, it's not pleasant on a physical level. The high-pitched sounds, the crazy weird noise, you might think of monsters in your room growling. You hear all kinds of crazy things because you're, you're literally passing through different dimensions to get out of your body. And for some people, it's so uncomfortable that they'll literally stop it and then flop back into their body and think they fell off a building because they're uncognitive of their experiencing. So they're seeing it as a dream state, but it's really not. And... For me, I just accept it. So I always know where I'm going because if I go, if the, if the, if if I come out of my body and the, I see myself in my bed, I see the ground open up. Um, I know that it's taking me to a dimension of the underworld, and I, I've, I've, I, and it's not like the underworld is just like you know, it's it's in a dimension that is very similar to middle in the middle of the earth. Like it's a, it's a dimension that's inside of the earth. Or what you consider inside of the earth, and if I'm if I'm going to a higher realm to communicate with an angel or a master or a being who is on in the heavenly realms that we call heaven, um, I see a portal, a stargate above me, and I go into it above. And so sometimes I don't really want to go, and I'll be honest. Like sometimes the floor will open up and I fall in, and it's this thing starts sucking me in. And I have to change course because I'm not ready to deal. I don't, I've dealt with so much in my life during the day in the physical form. I don't feel like going in the underworld because, like, face it, there are levels in the underworld that are scary as shit, you know. And I, even though I have, you know, trained and as a spirit shaman and through my training as a shaman, learned how to navigate these worlds, sometimes seeing people killing each other over and over again because they're stuck in a loop isn't the pleasant thing you want to see, you know, or watching a field of a soldiers fighting and killing themselves and then rewinding it again and doing it again because they're stuck in a loop or watching someone murder a woman and constantly cry and then go back into a loop again. It's not pleasant, but then there's places in the underworld that are look like cities on earth where people are living their lives and they have assignments and they're doing things and I can go and integrate and talk with them. So Sometimes I'm not ready and I, I immediately go, no, I'm not, I don't want to go there right now. I'm, I'm not prepared to go there right now. And then all of a sudden I, I just start getting pushed back up towards my body. But when I go to the underworld, um, I usually meet up with other people on earth who are also a net soul navigators who um, it's really funny because sometimes we'll even say things like, I'll be like, where are you from? And they're like, I live in Texas and um, I'm like 13 years old or I live in this place and I'm this age. And like, you know, and I'm like, we should find each other back in our physical bodies, you know? And um, so it's really cool. And I actually have some friends of mine who actually did find me in my life uh, because we made a pack in that, in that place to like find each other on the physical plane and we're still friends to this day. 
So we go down there. I usually go by myself or I, I, get, I get met up with a group. We get clear assignments of what we, what we can do. So if mine is to help like suicide victims or someone who can't forget, uh, who went to war or one woman I helped who drowned her children um, because she lost everything she had and she killed her kids and then committed suicide, I go into her loop. And I watch her loop, I watch her loop, and then I wait and I bring my consciousness into her loop. And while, when I catch her attention, I let her know this isn't really happening anymore. And then if they, if they engage, then I pull more into them and then I engage into their consciousness. And then all of a sudden I create a space for us to connect into and we go, I create like a how do you call it, like a, a dome or some place for us to talk. And then we talk and I let them know that I can take them to heaven. And then they say yes. And then I, I immediately like take them, I take them through a stargate and I bring them to heaven. And I see their family members, you know, they're welcoming them, welcoming them and coming and hugging them. And there's tears from the soul, um, the spur of the spirit, you know, like recognizing, you know, their transition and then they're smiling and happy. And, and then I leave and I go back to the world and I continue my assignments. You're like a fucking super holy Uber driver. Yeah. The g- <laughs> yeah, basically. Basically, but sometimes I have to deal with things. Like there are beings in the underworld who don't very much like me. And um, it's funny because one time this woman in Italy was possessed and the spirit that was possessing her that she brought in was telling me like, like how dare you come into our world? Like it, so there's beings that don't like me and they test me. Like they'll test me to see if I'll get angry. Or they'll bring, they'll take the form of my father or take the form of someone that caused pain to me and see if I react in the way of attack or whatever so they can see that there's a weakness and I react with love and then they get irritated and they go away. But there's some beings that literally will follow me back to my body and stand in my room and have a confrontation with me. And my confrontation is always the same. Do we have any Kleenex or anything? My confrontation is always the same. Thank you. My confrontation is always the same. And what it is, is I, I always operate with a place of love. So they have no power over me. The moment I go into a reaction of fear, anger, any of these types of things. Like I remember once a spirit like morphed itself into all these scary things. I remember once a spirit uh, morphed itself into Freddy Krueger. Because as a kid, I used to have a fear of Freddy Krueger. And I remember this shaman friend of mine told me from Mongolia, he says, you, you have a spirit that is attacking you by using your childhood fears against you and it's coming in one of your forms. What form is it coming? I said, it's coming as Freddy Krueger because I see it every time I go to the underworld, it starts coming after me. So it's like, you have to confront that. You have to confront that you put that into your head. Now it's matching that to, to, to break you down. So that's why I tell people don't watch scary movies because the spirits in the underworld are watching you and they go, oh, you're afraid of this monster. Oh, you're afraid of that. Oh, you're afraid of that. Let's make that much more pronounced. Let's make you dream about it. So then they go into your dream world and then they take on that shape and that form and scare you and they break down your, 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 your spirit level and you become more susceptible to them influencing parasites into you and getting you to do drugs, getting you to drink, getting you to do things that you don't even realize it's happening because they've been breaking you down for quite some time. So I deal with those kind of spirits, but because I am really versed in the dark arts, I have one of my friends, Bonnie Wright, she played uh, Ginny Weasley in Harry Potter, and she always says to me, if you were a teacher in Harry Potter, Derek, you literally are the teacher of the dark arts because I, I have no problem facing the worst evil on the planet and standing in its face with pure love and being like, let's do this. Because I, I, I... I know that love is the is the only power that they cannot um, they cannot defy they can't fight, and when I was a kid in training in shamanism, one of the things that they used to train me in was how to deal with spirits. And I remember one time one of my elders said to me, "You're going to be visited by these two types of spirits that are going to come to you. If you let them get into your head, they can actually make you hurt yourself. So you need to learn how to deal with it." And I was like, "When?" And they're like, "It can come any night now." And one night, my friend Johnny and his girlfriend Sarah was. I let them sleep in my bed because they were a couple, and I was on my mat on the floor next to my dog Dexter, who was my um, my golden retriever. I fell asleep. My body starts shaking. Whenever my body starts shaking profusely in my sleep, I know there's a spirit nearby. If it's a spirit of light, my body doesn't shake like that. If it's a spirit that has distortion, my body shakes. 
My friend Johnny wakes me up. My dog's hair is risen. Johnny goes, the room is cold. Why is the room cold when the heater's on? I said, I know why. Stay here. I'll be right back. And I opened up the door, went into the living room. It was dark and the spirit was, I could hear it talking. It was moving circles around me. And it's like, we know you're scared. We know you're afraid. We could hurt you. You're so afraid. You're so afraid. You're so afraid. And it kept making its voice bigger and bigger and bigger. And I remember my training and I remember going, I remember a voice in my head was like, oh my God, what am I doing right now? This is crazy. And the other voice goes, stop thinking like that. You're giving it power. Think the opposite. Focus on love. Let them know, I love you. I'm not here to fight you. Don't you know I love you? I want you to come home to the light. That's where we all want you to come home to. And the spirit got weaker and weaker and weaker until finally it confronted me. And it were these two men and they were brothers. They lived at one time on earth and they did all of these very uh, nefarious things to people and literally because I kept telling them I love them and so forth, they got in my face and said, how could you love something like us? Look at what we did. And I was like, I'm not here to judge you. I'm here to bring you home. And immediately the light blasted. I saw the light uh, go on to them. Their whole entire Goric form that they took on changed. And there were these two brothers, like they were looking like they were almost like farmers with a hat and like brown hair. And they were like, thank you. And then they then went, Pfft. And I was like, yes, yes, I did it. And like literally it was so huge for me because I told my sister, I was like, I did it, I did it. I faced the, like this scary monster and the fair and, the, and these spirits. And so every time, like when I was in Italy doing like, you know, working with people in exorcisms and stuff, I stopped going in and speaking and going into these talks. I just went in and was like, why are you in this person's body? Why did they bring you in? What are they not wanting to take responsibility for? Why are you taking responsibility for it for them? And then the spirit would go, and the person was like, oh, my God, I don't feel it anymore. And I started getting really good at it. And it became this, like, natural part of me being Shaman Durek. I always get called to face the darkness in people's lives. I've had voodoo queens call me. I've had uh, shamans in Africa ask for assistance. I've had gypsies who have been fighting with other witches who had things that were sent to them. I, they asked me to come in. And I was, one time I was in Turkey. This person uh, put a curse on this person's shop. I said, we got to pour milk here. These are the things we need to do. I know all of the dark arts. When someone puts a curse, I know exactly how to get the curse off. Someone does black magic. I know how to break the black magic. When someone create, when monsters come in, people like parents will call me and be like, my son keeps having nightmares. I'm like, here's what you're going to do. And I tell them exactly what to do. And it's just, it's, it's, it's almost literally like I came here to confront the darkness as a being of love. And and that's why I love uh, Jesus so much because Jesus was a being of love who interfaced with the darkness in the desert and the darkness told him what the people were going to do to him and said, why would you, why would you want to continue? Like, there's no need for it. And literally he said, like, in, in his words, like, you have no power over me and I'm, I choose to go into this situation. I choose to have the people beat me. I choose these things because I understand that I have to do this in, um, and not have to, it's a different word. I choose to do this for the sake of their awakening that you can kill, but you can't destroy the human spirit. And not in this whole like, uh, I don't know why religious people need to put his cross everywhere because I'm sure that's just like, you know, to me, on I have a whole viewpoint on that. But the point I'm saying is the love of Jesus, the love of Lord Siddhartha, the love is so powerful. When darkness comes in the room, I had a girlfriend call me up and she said she was held down in paralysis state. She called me, she, she wrote me on Instagram and then I gave her my number and she called me. I said, look, I said, you have to do this thing. It's called blazing. What you do is you focus on everything you love. If it's your dog, if it's your mom, it's your boyfriend, it's your husband, whatever it is, focus on it and the spirit of darkness will leave you because you're, it's, it's scared of you. Because darkness is more scared of humans than it, and then humans should be scared of darkness. What about on a personal? By the way, you have such an interesting life. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. On a, I listen to you, and, and I just think, man, I'm glad. I just have to wake up, meditate, <laughs> have a cup of coffee, try to be a decent guy. You know, let someone in in traffic when they want to pull in front of me and call it a day. Uh, but 
on that embracing the darkness in order to get to the light in my own, you know, recovery from addiction and all kinds of weird shit that's happened to me and for me in my life, what's enabled me to overcome those things and continue to do so is not by hiding and playing love and light like spiritual bypass, but really going into the belly of a beast within myself and seeing the hatred and the the desire for revenge and the deep terror and um and the guilt and all of that shame and um and just the fear and the the lust the wanting the craving the envy the jealousy all of the lower nature the only way i've ever been able to successfully overcome any of those things is just absolutely fucking facing it and owning it yes. so in a in a very you know personal level that's been my experience of transmuting darkness by absolutely owning it and going hey this is who i am and that's called engagement yeah in in that moment it's sort of it's like what you're describing but not for other people in other dimensions but within the dimension of myself is saying wow i i have the capacity of that spectrum within me and, absolutely and by denying oh no i'm i love everyone i'm all love no i'm not all love you fucking scratch my car, <laughs> you know? <laughs> you in the, in the Whole Foods parking lot? You you watch how fast that love goes away, you know, mm. things like that. But then ha- observing, oh look, now I want to kill that person because they threatened me, and you know all that shit. I mean, that's a very superficial example, but just I understand where you're one that's from. a common that people would understand. But see, I can't suppress that desire to kill someone or to hurt someone. I have to me personally own it and acknowledge it. And that's what makes it dissipate and then not get acted on. And those thoughts then don't torture me with resentment and reliving the harms that have been done to me and the abusers that took advantage of me and robbed me of my innocence and all of that. It's really been by by facing it. Does that make sense from your paradigm? Absolutely. What you're doing basically is you're engaging the spirit that is getting into the algorithms of your thought by getting you to play out its discord that it went through when it had a human body. And because you choose not to like engage it from the point of believing that it's you but you actually accept it do the acceptance of engagement you are actually clearing the energy of it seems to be working because i've become a much more kind loving mm-hmm. compassionate person all the time mm-hmm. <laughs> you mm-hmm. know? it works coming from someone who used to live in that you know like you were talking about metallica it brought me back to my teen years i mean i was so angry man i just hated the world i hated myself i was so full of darkness and hopelessness and I mean, it's like, it's a miracle that I lived and didn't kill myself. Thank God for drugs, especially heroin. That was the one for me that was, when I finally found that, it was like, ah, okay, now there's a safe place for me to hide. Mine's was crystal meth. For a minute, for a minute. I mean, that lasted about six months (laughs) and then that turned into a nightmare. But there was, there were moments there where it was like, oh, this gooey warm place where I don't feel anything anymore, Mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And then that sort of runs its course. And, you know, then I, now my answer is the antithesis of that model is to absolutely feel everything and find that most of those things that I've been running from are phantoms. It's just like I feel uncomfortable for a few minutes, and that's it. Okay, that was what I was afraid of my whole life. But see, that's shamanic what you what you're speaking of, hmm, because the understanding of, you know, like for mine's was crystal meth, and you know, for me when I did crystal meth, I felt like at peace. I felt like, oh, <laughs> I can't imagine that. <laughs> yeah, I felt at peace because I felt oh, like that drug man makes me feel like. If I took crystal meth, or I used to smoke a lot of crack, and mm-hmm. it was the same thing. It just doesn't last as long as crystal meth. But say I was like nervous about something, or uh, someone had hurt me and betrayed me, and I couldn't stop obsessing about it. If I did stimulants like meth or crack, it would actually magnify the thing that I was trying to suppress and make it a million times worse. Interesting. Whereas so from mines was the opposite. opiates and alcohol and like the downers would actually mask it, and I'd be like, nah, I'm not worried about that anymore. So it's so it's so it's funny how uh, brain chemistry works mm-hmm. like that. Hundred percent. And and even when I was a drug addict, I did I didn't like hanging out with tweakers. We Me like either. Didn't, we didn't vibe. I liked hanging out with junkies. You know, I mean, they would steal your shit quite often, but uh, they were mellow. <laughs> you know what I mean? 
And the the tweakers and junkies didn't kind of mix. I like so, hanging out with spiritual spiritual uh, tweakers, not just tweaker tweakers, but spiritual tweakers. But so what happened with the Chris? Because that was something I wanted to cover here, and we're you know we're going into like our tenth hour on the show, which is fine with me. It's if you're up for it, um, you have an, uh, an abundance of energy. But oh my, how, how did you get into? Yeah, how did you get into are you, that steak that I ate earlier? By the way, is totally evaporated, and I feel like I've never eaten once in my entire life. I'm famished, <laughs> so maybe you're onto something with this Omod thing. Uh, but with the crystal meth, like, how did you get into that, and why aren't you high on it right now? So I got. Or into, are you? I, no. So I'm a purist, so I don't put anything in my body. Um, I got into crystal meth. And when I say that also, too, by the way, it's not because I'm a purist because I did something wrong. I don't look at it like that. I actually love the drugs that I took. And the thing is, the drugs helped me through a lot of the abuse, the molestation, you know, the constant being locked up in closets and rooms and all the things that I went through as a child in my family and racism and all things that I experienced. The crystal mess brought me back to, to a place where I could, like, meditate and be present. And like see things and like not feel the bombardment of aggressive attacks from everyone around me, including my environment. So it did numb you. It numbed me. You got the desired effect. It didn't for you. It didn't magnify your problems, obviously. No, it didn't magnify it. It just basically put me in a state where I could actually see everything like I'm watching a movie. And there are times where I would be up for like sometimes like seven days on crystal meth and I would see the walls evaporate. And I would see like spirits on the walls talking to me and saying things to me. And I would start talking to them. I'd be like, how are you on this wall doing all these things? They're like, we've always been here. You just don't see us because now you have reached a state of delirium. And you are now able to let that part of your mind that wants to control your environment be not in control anymore. And now you can see us. You went fractal. Yeah. Yeah. Completely. (laughs) And, you know, and for me, you know, um, it's interesting because I did a lot of things. I've done heroin. I did crystal meth. I've done cocaine. I mean, I pretty much did everything under the sun, in, including certain types of African plant medicines and so forth. All of it, you know, the way my elders brought it up to me, because even when I was doing stuff in my training, they were like, we know you're on this. Like, we know that you're this, and we're not here to say it's wrong. This is your medicine right now. And so what you need to understand is why you're taking this medicine. And that was a really good eye-opener for me because – Instead of me just taking it and going into that space and why I was drinking when I was an alcoholic, it was just simply like, why is this your med- Why is this my medicine? Why am I using drinking to get out of my body? Because drinking is an alchemic uh, form that was created by ancient times that they would use to pull your spirit out of the body so that a ghoul can come into your body. Why do I want the ghoul in my body and why do I want to leave my body? The ghoul does reveal a lot to you about your real feelings. So a lot of times people will drink because they get to feel like they have all their inhibitions dropped, but they don't realize it's the ghoul that's doing that, but also pulling them and tethering them away from their body. I enjoyed being away from this situation. I didn't find very f- uh, the earth plane to be a very fun place as I do now because I couldn't change things with my mind. I found it to be very um, entrapping. I felt that people's rules and conditions were like being in a prison. And I thought that being in school was the worst prison for me. Oh, God. Um, I it couldn't w- understand. It was. That it, wasn't just you, bro. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Public school in the United States of America But is... they push you into it. Oh, like, man. Or you get truancy, and then you go to, you know, juvie, or you go to, you know, and I've been there, done that as well. And so the thing is, is that... It helped me at the time, but when I was willing to look at the idea of why do I need this medicine, and when I was willing to see that, that's when I decided I didn't need it anymore. But to to clear myself from it, I had to go all the way up to the mountains. I was in Mount Tamalpais. I had an amazing doctor named Dr. David, an amazing guy named Mike LaFoon, who basically opened up this house for me where they, they used to, Dr. David lived. And he would have me gonging every day, walking through nature. He had me, he was putting me on all kinds of like green algae. I've never even heard of it. And this is like, you know, uh early 90s, late 80s, you know, green algae, Manchurian mushroom, what they now call kombucha, all of these different things he, that he was like sourcing from all these unique places in the world that he was putting in my system and literally detoxifying these things out of my body. And when I got it out of my body and I was able to start communicating to my body, my body was telling me it doesn't need these things and that I need to face, I had this, so I decided to sit on a mattress with a bucket 
with a lot of tissue and I would put the things that I thought I needed, such as cocaine or whatever it was around me. And then I would let the emotion come up and I would look towards the alcohol or the drug and be like, I could do that right now. Or I could go on a shamanic journey right now and just let myself fall apart and scream and rip pillows or you know, whatever it is that I felt like I needed to become and to morph into a crazy primal animal. If I had to run down the street butt naked, whatever I needed to go through in my shamanic journey to get me to, to pull through that emotion and then resolve it, I put myself through it. I like the f framing drugs as, as medicine. Mm -hmm. That was something that was really helpful to me in my own recovery and continues to be is is to not demonize no chemicals it's it's you know this is it's like a self prohibition right we look at what prohibition does legally i i'm i'm down with portugal and fucking netherlands those guys got it figured out especially portugal they were like we can't have the war on drugs is not working let's legalize everything crime down 50 percent. i mean it's just insane how that worked but the prohibition and for myself has not worked either it's like making friends with that medicine and actually being grateful that I had it. I love the way that you frame that. That's shamanic as well. When, too. I, when I was a kid, uh, the first thing that I found was uh, weed, you know, I mean, I grew up by Mount Tamalpais actually. And uh, when I found three things, uh, pornography, you know, dirty magazines when I was a little, little ass kid, five, six years old, weed, you know, seven, eight, nine, uh, and then rock and roll. Jimi Hendrix, fucking those three things saved my life. Those were my medicines. What's funny is though, and I want to see your perspective on this, that those medicines throughout my life, and even when I stopped doing drugs, there were still cigarettes and haagen and gratuitous sex and any other thing that feels fucking good or produces dopamine, that those medicines all seem to kind of have an expiration date where they stop you stop having the desired result, A, and the side effects of the medicines start to outweigh whatever benefit there is, even if there's just a little bit of benefit left. Right. Does that make sense? Absolutely. From your perspective? Absolutely. But it, I think it's it's healthy to not go, oh, shit, I'm a fucking pervert or a bad person because I need pornography to not feel lonely at night or I eat two pints of haagen because I can't just be a regular guy and have like a couple tablespoons and keep it in the fridge for tomorrow. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, you just gorge on it. Yeah. haagen just... is so good. <laughs> but you see, the, the guilt and shame spiral in addiction or in compulsivity is that you do the thing because you need your medicine, even if you don't frame it as medicine at that point. You do the thing, then you feel guilty, then you feel shame. That creates more negative feelings and then you need more medicine. And that's that. That's just, why I'm not into AA. It's a vicious I, cycle of uh, a vicious cycle of addiction, you know. Yeah, I mean, I went to AA, and I was like, "This is making me want to drink more." You must have went to a bad meeting. <laughs> well, the thing is, is that I, I mean, I just, I just was like everyone was saying, "Once an alcoholic, always an alcoholic." And yeah. in shamanism, we don't look at things like that. We look at everything as you are a, a quantum being. You are never the same. So there's nothing that could ever be the same. So you know, by me saying once an alcoholic, always an alcoholic. That's not possible because I'm constantly, I'm constantly morphing. So my energy of that energy just constantly was, re, was creating a, a, a block in my being because there was the shamanic teaching and then there was that information. And then my friends were like, oh, but you know, I, I relapsed like this. I said, you relapsed because you're looking at it from a negative point of view. You're not looking at it as medicine and understanding why your body needs this medicine. And like with anything, once we start, we start loving it and, br and embracing it and stop seeing it as the monster or the demon or the scary thing that we think it is that's destroying our lives is when we actually start to overcome it. And this is how I, I approach it with my clients who come to me today who are have alcoholists who are in AA who are have you know uh, uh, heroin addictions and drug addictions and you name it and the reason why I get such a success uh, rate from them is because I teach them how to change their perception of what they're experiencing versus them de demonizing it and then fighting this demon that they feel they have to fight because that demon just keeps them in fighting mode and as long as they stay in fighting mode there's a point where they're going to feel like they can't fight anymore and give in yeah. where if they actually see it from a point of view of I'm going to embrace it with love and not get it, put this this uh, this, uh, this kind of label or this idea about it and then just be, a, be a, observant of my energy with it. It's the same thing as like if you have something in your environment 
What is your association with it? How do you observe it in your energy field? And when people start realizing that they can observe things in their energy field, they can observe what medicine, they can observe what music feels like to them, they can observe these things, that's the power of choice. And that choice is where we get our power from. It's the idea that we get to make that choice. That's the free will that all humans w want to be able to have, which is to be unencumbered, to be able to experience things when they choose to experience it. That's why I don't believe in like hammering people and making them feel bad about things because, you know, like people will come to me and they say, I really love working with you. It's not because I, it's not because I'm doing anything, you know, what I'm doing other than my shamanic work. But the reason why is because when they come in, I make everything into a joke. Like I make them laugh at every single thing at they're doing in their life and they leave fully lit and then like, there's like, oh my God. And when I do my workshops, I do the same thing. I crack joke after joke after joke after joke because people laugh at the situation. They laugh at darkness. Darkness transforms into the light. They look at it from this place like I have to deal with it. It stays heavy and strong. And, and I believe that it's about a life of ease and grace. And we are supposed to move through our obstacles with grace and ease, not this intensity, hardness, beat you up, got to follow this rule, got to do this thing, got to do that. Because you're just basically affirming why you're actually doing what you're doing and why it's been a problem and why you're going to stay stuck in it. The, the, the big situation that people go through is that they stay stay stuck in this abusive uh, behavior because they keep looking at it from, an, um, from, a, from a place of force and I have to, to a place of love and acceptance and joy. Amen. What's your view on uh, healthy sexual behavior, monogamy, polygamy, multiple partners, free sex, prostitution, pornography, the sexual human experience? in your own life or, or in general. Okay. Assuming that we're already going to take the shame and all that shit out of it. Cause we already covered that. Okay. But I mean, just like what's, what's healthy. What do you suggest? So I don't go into the idea of what's healthy because every person's understanding of health, when it comes to health and wellness for me as a wellness leader in the world, it's very subjective to each person. You can't just say, oh, this is healthy and this applies to everyone. It doesn't. True. We are all multiple. And at different points in your life too. Exactly. And you don't even know. Like, you know, this person could, you know, be literally a non-sexual person and all of a sudden they hear a song and they, you know, all of a sudden they're full on raging sexual was it the song that did it? Was the was it the nostalgic understanding of that song because the first girlfriend they ever had or the first boyfriend they ever had, that was the first time they had sex because that song was playing? We can't really say what actually arouses and what works for another person. What I can say is we need to remove the labels. Polygamy, bisexual, straight, gay, these things do not antiquate in the spirit world to what a person is. You are here to have an experience. Now, how you choose to bring that experience is a choice. And this is what I will say from the perspective of what you asked me. Conscious or unconscious? There you go. Yeah. Do you understand? Yeah. You could be a person who wants to have a one-nighter. Fine. But give that one-nighter consciousness. Don't go into that one nighter drunk and like belligerent and just like blacked out and you had sex and you're like, ah, oh, yeah, mm. you know, <laughs> you know, you make that sound so unfun. You know, I'm just saying it's just like yeah. the, the walk of shame. What walk of shame? Walk with pride. Walk yeah. with like you had great sex with someone that you chose to give 150% to. Don't treat the person like they're just a piece of slab of meat or a hole to stuff. Treat that person as if they were the greatest lover from that spirit merged you together for a reason and that you're sharing your vessel with them and they're willing to share their vessel with you. And that is such a sacred act. And I feel like the sacredness in, in the, I call it the sacred sexuality. We have lost connection to the understanding. Like there was a time where I was traveling through Europe and I met this girl and it was only a brief time in Italy. We had this wonderful connection. We had amazing sex for like three days. And then literally like she went her way, I went my way. And that memory of that sacred moment will live on inside of me. I didn't go, oh my God, I just had like this three, this, this, this three day sex ex ex you know, experience with her and I just used her. No, I honored her. For, and, and she honored me. That's consciousness. Unconsciousness is 
I am depleted in my being and I just need to get off. And I don't really care if it's with you or with you or with you or with you, whatever. I just want to get off and I am not going to be fully present in love with you in this state because I don't know you. So I'm not going to be in love with you. And instead of realizing like you're having sex with God in another body, meaning you're having sex with yourself in another body. How would you, I always say to people, how would you kiss yourself if you were to kiss yourself? How would you hug yourself? How would you touch yourself? Whenever time I hug someone, I always hug them the way that I would want to be hugged. When I hug someone, I think about all the blessings. I'm blessing them up while touching their body. If I rub my hand on someone, like on the way over here, I was with the Uber and he said, you know, you smell really great. You know, and I asked him, I said, have you been married? He said, I was two wives, but we divorced and this, and we have this deep conversation. We started talking about spirit and life and this and everything. And I reached out across the seat and rubbed his arm and he reached out and was like, no one's ever done that before. And I'm like, because you're a living being, you matter. You, ha- you are an essence of one aspect of the quantum aspect of God in front of me. You're not the Uber driver. You're just, that's what you're doing right now for whatever means it is to bring income and currency into your life. But you are a living being. And I think what happens is people forget that nuance, that beautiful nuance uh, that needs to be seen. And that's the conscious part that I'm speaking of. And so what happens is the reason why it's become so polluted is that people feel they get their power in sex because of religion, because of the system saying something is wrong, this is not wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is not okay, this is not okay. So people take, again, their power in the places where they feel they can be defiant. But the defiance, you want to be defiant, you want to get, you want to watch porn. It's like, I don't have a, an issue with people watching porn. It's just what you are operating in that porn with. I have friends who are porn stars they meditate. I educate them. I sit down with them. So one friend of mine said to me, I came to earth to bring pleasure to men who aren't able to have women. Okay, great. But she does it with consciousness. She's going in, not like, oh, you're just giving me money and I'm just going to take your money. No, she goes in and she fully commits to the fact that that's another soul that she's sharing her body with and she gives them 100 to 200, sometimes 500% of her heart energy while being with them. I don't see a problem in that. But some people would go, oh God, she's degrading herself. Who are you to say she's degrading herself? Are you inside her body? Do you know who she is? But then there are some girls that I have some friends who are porn stars who did things with like Rocco Sid Freddy and Nacho Vidal and all these people. And I had to help them pull themselves out of the porn industry because it's not really authentically where they wanted to be. And now they're nurses and one of them is going to medical school and another one um, started a... Um, a tantric couples training to help people to build more conscious, more centered, more focused life because she was with Charlie Sheen and she left that craziness and I helped her to formulate being a a geisha consciousness to the modern time of how can she utilize her skill that she learned in that sex world to be able to help people who can't get into that space. But again, polyamorous, this thing, that thing, who you choose to be with is your business. As long as you're operating from a conscious place of respect for the human being, you're not utilizing it to feed off of them like a vampire because you're insecure and you feel like by doing this is making you a better person. If you're really committing to creating something beautifully musical with that person when you come together, I don't have a problem with it. What I boil down uh, from that is it's not so much, and this could apply to many areas of life, is it's not what you're doing but how you're doing it right which brings me into i think the last thing that i kind of we covered god sex let's talk about money okay (laughs) that's the last thing i want to uh, cover with you until we have another three-hour conversation probably right after we stop recording uh (laughs) and this has to do with desire attachment lust wanting personal security wealth security currency you used that term moments ago uh you know the the fluidity of cash of getting money for services this is something that fascinates me uh, for a number of reasons a is that i've had a relationship myself with money that's been very limiting Mm -hmm. and uh had a lot of ideas that i've uncovered recently in terms of uh 
having a desire to be wealthy and have a certain lifestyle. I mean, not even like I need private jets. I'm just talking like, I'd like a nice house and be able to travel a little bit. My needs aren't even that extreme, especially in the context of Los Angeles. But I found a lot of limiting beliefs. <coughs> mm-hmm. I found limiting beliefs in terms of these ideas that I developed early in life, such as um, wealthy people are evil, they're selfish, they're assholes, uh, things like that. And, yes. And so I've been working through that, mm. A, B, and this is kind of, you know, statement slash question. I'll dovetail it into one final thought to make it make sense. But just to give you some context here where I'm going with this. So there's the scarcity mindset of like, I'm not worthy of actually being comfortable and having the type of home mm. that I'd want to have and all that, right? Then there is this idea of debt. And yesterday... I paid off the last $4,000 on the credit card that was a grand total of $100,000 in credit card debt that I've been sitting on for a long time. And I've always, since I started making a living as a drug dealer at 18 years old, I've always spent more money than I made up until two years ago when I finally had a breakthrough and was like, oh, something's wrong with the fucking math here. I make more money all the time. Start businesses, successful career. I'm a stylist. I'm crushing. I'm doing shit. It's not like I can't make the money, but I had this addictive relationship to spending it, right? And get this high off of like spending it. And then the stress of like, I don't really have the money, but I'm going to take this trip anyway. And next thing you know, I'm in all this debt. And so when I paid that fucking debt off yesterday, dude, no, it was two days ago, actually, uh, I and I keep going, why am I in such a good mood? I go, holy shit. I had this weird karmic, I was breaking a spiritual law, which is like a biblical law, really, if it comes down to it, that I'm borrowing something against, I have nothing to secure that debt. A bank lent me money to go to fucking Brazil five times or whatever I did back in 2003 to start racking up that debt, right? And then there's, and that goes into that self, self esteem and unworthiness is that subconscious knowledge of this debt that exists there feeling limited and one's ability to uh to to earn their keep to earn enough money for their lifestyle so there's this thing that i've looked at uh where there have been some blocks there and it's really exciting because i'm starting again like bring those shadows into the light and i never even told anyone this shit publicly like i never tell anyone i have credit card debt how fucking embarrassing i'm not going to talk about that shit but I'm becoming more courageous because as I talk about it again, I'm bringing that out into the open. So there's there's the debt piece. There's the limited thinking, the limited beliefs about earning. That's part A. Part B is the idea of being someone like yourself and like myself to a certain degree that is now monetizing themselves as a brand that's spiritual that wants to get charge a bunch of money to do work in the spiritual realm. Mm-hmm. And I still have a little bit of a block with that. I talked to, when I interviewed um, Guru Jagat about it, she was like, what are you talking about? Yeah, I love Guru Jagat. I have fucking millions for the shit I do. It's awesome. Mm-hmm. I was like, oh, you can do that? She's like, yeah, who cares? You know. Mm-hmm. So give me your view on, on on money and all that. I know it's not a well-formed question, but it's these are the thoughts that, you know, I'm, I'm working out and in my own experience, and I'd love to hear your insight on and how you're working with all that. So I have, okay, so, and it's interesting because I also deal with debt. You know, I've been, I had a house here in um, Los Angeles and Hollywood Hills and also one in Silver Lake. And I've dealt with, like, I've been in relationships with people who I've been in relationships, which is my responsibility. And I was always the guy in the relationship who was always like, um, whatever you want, whatever you want, whatever you want. So as I made money, I was like, you know, bu- buying things. But then when I didn't have the money to buy them things, I put it on credit cards. And then there are times where I would pay off all the credit cards and then they would run up the credit cards because they needed to have like this new thing or this new outside, outdoor set by the pool or, you know, whatever it was. And so when I broke up and I've been in a lot of situations where I've broken up a lot, um, I always go through this whole period of like giving people what they need to get back on their feet. And so I take on the debt and I have taken on debt and I'm still, you know, processing through that debt and really looking at it, what it is spiritually for me. 
And what I found, um, what it is, is an imbalance within my being that feels that it needs to cre- have these things to fill in areas within my own life. And I, I had a house in Hollywood Hills that I was renting one house. I was paying $10,000 a month, and I was only home two weeks out of the year. And I was in Sweden, living in Stockholm, Sweden. And I woke up one morning and was like, I, I can't do this anymore. I don't need this house. I don't need the pool. I don't need the BMWs. I don't need all of these things because they're not really fulfilling me, you know? But I, and I started looking at where did I have this belief that it did fulfill me? And then I started going deeper and I realized, oh, I was programmed that I am not a stable individual unless I have this, 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 and this. And then I started looking at my house And looking at all the things I have in my house and asking myself, does any of these things inside my house affect me in a way that lifts me and shifts me and keeps me in a high consciousness to feel good, to feel empowered, to feel loved, to feel, you know, creative and so forth? Or do I just have things because I feel like I have an empty wall, I should fill that with something. And so... I started really paying attention to it and I started paying attention to, you know, paying off debt is also the debt that I feel inside of guilt and shame that I hold on inside of myself in those relationships, in those situations, however I accumulated it. Whatever I did, it was was me paying off my own debt to, um, to my spirit on some level, right? So I look at spiritual debt. What is spiritual debt and how does it affect me on the physical level? Because if everything exists in one frame, it must exist in other areas. So I started looking at what those other areas are and I started realizing that the debt was accumulated because I felt guilty or I felt not good enough because I wasn't meeting whatever the outside world was telling me I should meet as according to me being me. And that's how the debt came. So the debt came from me lying to myself, me manipulating myself, me not being in honesty with myself. That has changed a great deal in my life. And there was a time in my life when I was doing shamanic work at a very earlier time where I did it on a donation basis. And I had a situation where the Bill Gates family, um, one of the members of the family asked me to come and do work on them. And I drove all the way from LA to go and work on this woman. And I paid for gas. I put, I had to, you know, I had to stay in a place. I had to pay for food. You know, it was a very costly trip. And I worked on them for like three, three, three days. And at the very end of the day, she said, well, what should I pay you? And I said, well, it's based on donations. So whatever you feel you want to give. And she gave me $25. <laughs> Oh, snap. By the way, just as a side note, and please hold that thought, um, Bill Gates is one of the biggest investors in Monsanto. Carry on. (laughs) Anyway. I'll just let that later. So what happened to me is two things came to me. I got very, very angry at her, and I thought, you are a billionaire, and you gave me $25? So I just kind of took it, you know, And then what I realized, I was angry with myself because I didn't acknowledge my own value, my own worth. And I thought that was very fascinating, you know? And then I had another situation that happened right after that where I literally, when I did start to charge people, I had a friend who didn't have money and through working with me, he became um, a millionaire. And Can I start working with you? (laughs) (laughs) I already am, actually. Yes. (laughs) And basically... He asked me to do a session and he asked me for a discount. And I, at that point, I looked at him and I said, did you ask for a discount for your Ducati? Did you ask for a discount for that beautiful multi-million dollar house that you just bought? Damn. Did you ask for a discount for that new Ferrari you just bought? And he's like, no. I said, so why would you do that to a human being? Why would you ask me for a discount when you know that the way I create my livelihood is by being able to do these things, to create these services available? You know, there was, there'd be a great, for me, it would be really great to like live in the old times where people can bring apples and oranges to my door and I can just be the shaman that walks around and just constantly gives out healing to everyone. That would be great. But we live in a world where value and sustenance and currency is the trade-off of, of what someone values and appreciates. So if I did that now, no one would value the, the what I'm bringing to them. And secondly, 
having him do that taught me a valuable lesson. Another lesson was a woman came to me in New York and goes, wow, your gifts and your powers, I've worked with so many shamans and people around the world and they charge this, this, and this, and this healer charged that. You're charging like, what, 60 bucks? And your stuff is like, what are you doing? <laughs> oh, dude. You know? And then, yeah. so I went from that. Yeah. Then I had another situation where I had literally, you know, my prices went up and everything. And then I had this big celebrity come in and he came in and he looked at me and he said, he's a big country music singer. And he looks at me and he goes, I don't know if I really want to work with you. And I go, why? And he goes, because I saw B&W, you have this house in Hollywood Hills. And I think that, you know, you're a shaman, like you shouldn't have these things. And I said, well, why? And he goes, because you're offering spiritual services to people. You should just give it to people. And I said, oh, okay. So you feel that I should just give these things to people because it's a spiritual service. He goes, yes, because you're a spiritual person and you're doing spiritual things. And so that should be what you have should depend upon the public of what we think you should live in, what we think you should drive and what we think you should have depending upon the work that you're bringing. This forth. is that idea that I, I had to work through myself. Right. Yeah. Then I looked at him and I said, so I read an article about you in Rolling Stones recently. And I've noticed that you just bought a new house. You have expensive cars and you're, you, you do music, right? I go, would you consider your, your, this path of music spiritual? He goes, of course it's spiritual. I said, so why don't we just decide what you should get? Shouldn't we decide what you should get too? I mean. Yeah, okay, so I think I'm going to pay five bucks to get in your concert front row. <laughs> yeah, because that's what I feel that you should. You know, this right. is a, I'm having a spiritual moment through your music. Right. And he thought about it. And I said to him, you know, your judgment and your viewpoint of what you think I should or what you think I shouldn't do is dependent, then you need to apply that to yourself as well. And immediately he changed his mind and was like, okay, you have a point. I understand what you're saying. I got to a point, you know, and sometimes people will say that I'm very expensive because my sessions are $1,000 an hour. And, you know, and I do offer sliding scales to people starting at 500. But if someone comes to me who's like really sick and they're like going through medical stuff, it's all pro bono for them. Or I put them on my pro bono list. And I do a lot of give back through podcasts, through Instagram, through, you know, putting up posts to people, sharing sh shamanic knowledge, sharing things. But I'm not doing it out of guilt. I'm doing it because I want to give back to people. But I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to not be able to buy what I want to buy. And I'm not gonna want to, I'm not gonna like stress out because I can't get on an airplane first class every time I travel on an airplane. I will never sit in coach. Dude, I can't sit in coach. I can't I'm sit sorry. in coach. I can't do it. I can't sit in coach. It's torture. It's man. torture. We're tall. Yeah. We're, we're tall. So I mean, I can't do that. I and I'm yeah. traveling nonstop. And my my manager, who was my niece, I said to her, we only fly first class, and so I don't care. W when we stay somewhere, it's got to be a nice place because I have to take care of me. And that's how I antiquated the understanding of my value was if I really love the people as I say I do, if I really care about being there to put the power back in people's hands, to travel to these countries and get in faces of people who are creating a discord in these countries and really get them to open up conversation, I am dealing with a lot of stress. I am dealing with a lot of tumultuous energies. I am dealing with a lot of energies that are very uh, discordant. How can I say to another person, I love you, I want to be there for you, but I'm not showing up for myself. I'm not putting myself on that first class ticket. I'm, I'm not putting myself in a situation. I remember talking to my friend um, Ricky Lake and she was going on a trip and she was going to sit in coach. I said, girl, you have the money to go sit in first class. Just buy the damn first class ticket. She says, right, you're right. I should be using my money on myself, right? I shouldn't feel guilty about the fact that I have money and that I had a talk show and this and that and the other. I said, absolutely not, babe. Go on the first class. Stop messing around. She's like, I'm going to buy a ticket to first class. I said, good, because we have to take care of ourselves. I cannot be there for the world if I am not getting my, my massages and I'm not getting my time to, to nurture myself with healthy food and I'm not having a, a, a place where when I lay my bed, I have a soft pillow, a soft, wonderful mattress and bed for me to sleep and feel comfort, beautiful windows to look through, wonderful um, places for me to entertain my mind, to be able to sit down and read a book where I see plants, where I can feel energies around me that are filling me and, and giving me the sustenance that I need in order to be me. So I have 
I don't have, when people say, oh, you, you, are, how dare you do this, whatever, like, how dare you think that I should not ask for what I need in order to support and give and love and share my energy with this world? How dare you think that I should not be able to bring sustenance into my being, fill my vessel, because I'm constantly giving out of my vessel? And that changed everything for me. Yeah, that's powerful. And I won't play. Like I had a situation where uh, I was supposed to do this thing at Unplugged Meditation and they had called me up and said, we're, we have a membership thing where we're going to do like two, because memberships are going to pay, and you're going to get $2 for every head of every person that comes in. I was like, really? You really think that's what I'm going to do? I said, you have it all wrong. You're, you're, you're mistaken. I said, I'm sorry, honey. You're gonna, you mean $100 a head that comes in is what you're going to charge people. Well, you know, we can't do I said, well, then you don't get Shaman Durek. And when Guru Jagat, you know, because I, I do all of her, her incentives, and sometimes her team will decide a price for me for my workshop. She sends me a personal email and goes, and with them attached to it, don't you think this is a little too low to be offering Shaman Durek to come into my center and do a talk or to do a workshop? I think the price needs to go up. And her own team gets schooled by her. Like, how dare you <laughs> not right. give him luxury? Right. She even writes me when I come to town and do something in her center. She goes, she says, are they treating you like a king? Are they treating you with respect? Are they giving you what you need because of what you bring to the people? She's straight up about it. And I said, yes, my sweet sister. Yes, they are. She goes, good. She goes, that's fantastic. I'm happy to hear it. No one in this world, not you or anyone, should play small because and choose to have less because they feel guilty for being who they are and what they need. And they're like, you need things in order to be who you are. We are not living in where I can travel and someone's going to put me in a carriage and let me sleep in their barn. Because even if they did let me sleep in their barn with the stuff that I deal with in my life, I would say, no, thank you. You give me those silk sheets and you give me that bed with the beautiful window and the plant and the bathroom and the beautiful energies. And I want to see everything aesthetically pleasing to me because if not, I'm not coming. Amen. Can you be my agent? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, what's funny, dude, is I'm th I think about two things uh, when you're talking about that. And I think where the energy comes from on the other side of that is envy and jealousy. Who cares? Yeah. But you see what I'm saying? And then so... If I'm if I'm like oh god I feel that sense of guilt like oh, I shouldn't be making this money mm -hmm. I'm 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 out there helping people if people are judging that and like oh he fucking charges how much da, da, let da, da, da. them or he runs ads on his podcast let or whatever them. but here's the thing it's envy and jealousy on theirs but then it's my need for their approval and my lack of self esteem and self worth in myself to be like think whatever the fuck you want be jealous be a hater. I'm doing my thing, right? You want them to be that way. You want them to be that way. Look, one time um, a friend of mine who's an actress was written on Vanity Fair that she's like the most hated celebrity. And I sent her a message in the morning as I saw it. I knew it bothered her. And I said, I goes, honey, haters are lovers in disguise. Okay, let's get real about it. When someone is jealous about you and whatever, I tell them, get jealous, Get all these energies you feel you need to go through. Embrace that jealousy because then let that jealousy motivate your ass and put the fire under your ass to get you to do something with your life in the way that makes you feel good about your life. You want to use me as a catalyst to have your breakdown or feel upset and you need to shake around me. I told once a time I was speaking at Lightning in a Bottle and I said on stage to the whole audience, I was speaking to the crowd, I said, if you're not ruffling feathers on planet Earth, then what the hell are you doing? You have not, you're not here here to tippy toe around people's emotional insecurities. This is not the like me game, okay? It won't work anyway, because here's the reality of the world in which we live in. Every human being on this planet lives in a different dimension. You may be talking to someone who you may see in front of you, but they're actually in hell where they are in their spirit. So when they open their mouth, they're talking from the region that they're in. You can't respect, you can't uh, look to them for the perception of what you feel is right for you based on where they are in their evolution. You don't know where they are. And it's not for you to know where they are unless you want to know. Just have them talk for like five minutes. I can sit down with a person, listen to them talk for like 10 seconds, and I can tell you where they live. I don't care what you think because I don't, I, my life is not predicated upon what you think. My life is predicated upon what 
I think. And anyway, my being doesn't want your approval. My being wants my approval. If you, if I clean a house and I put that sponge down and you come in my house and tell me, oh my God, you did such a great job cleaning your house. Your house is so clean. Don't you think I know my house is clean? I would have never put the sponge down. I am grateful and thankful. I will hold my hand to my heart and be grateful for your blessings and grateful for your praise and grateful for your whatever it is that you're giving me. But I always tell people, you know what? If someone says to me, oh, Shaman Derek, you're so beautiful. I said, thank you. I appreciate that. And I'm so glad you see that in yourself. Because if someone is saying something that's beautiful and saying like, I really love what you're doing and da, 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 because that is what they're, re they're reflecting within themselves. That's the part of their spirit that sees you because they can't see what's in you and if they can see it in themselves. That's always tell people, get as deep as you can with yourself because the deeper you go with yourself is the deeper you'll be able to go with someone else. And if someone has jealousy, then let them have it. Let them sit in that space. Let them marinate in that space of jealousy so that they're able to go through the process that is necessary for them to rise out of that jealousy and into a place of self-love that is indicated based upon what is right for them and their vision and their creativity and their idea. And that's it. Nothing else. The last thing I want to ask you about is as you start to become successful career-wise and just doing your work, and even having been a kid, we didn't really go into your childhood, uh, you know, because we'll do that another time. But you, you realized early on that you have these abilities to see things and do things that maybe other kids didn't do. Now you're a grown-ass kid and you're out in the world doing things that are pretty fantastic my boy Elliot here was looking at you like what who is this dude you're seeing thing you know the things you do uh and getting notoriety and you hang out with all these celebrities and you do your shit out there in the world in a pretty public way how do you keep yourself from building a spiritual ego you know from thinking you're the shit and becoming arrogant and and blind to that, that because that's not trip. why I'm, I'm not here for that I didn't come to earth for that. I didn't come to earth to, to do things and, 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 and fill in this. If I go to a place where I feel like I, and I've met people, trust me, I've been on, on, on platforms where I've sat next to people who are like Hay House writers who are like, sit there in my face and it's all this spiritual ego. And I look at them and I say, are you kidding me? I mean, one time I was speaking to a group of people and they were like, we the luminaries and blah, blah, I have five Hay House books and blah, da, 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 da. I don't really care. I don't care how many books you read. Did the books change people's lives? One time this, I, was, I wrote my book in Turkey. Everyone's like, oh my God, you're an American writer in Turkey and your book is doing really well. I don't go around to people being like, so what did you think of my book? I don't give a shit about that. What I asked them was, did you get the message? Did you get the message? They said, yes, Shaman, I got the message. I said, good, that's good. I, for me, for me to put myself above you because like when people say, oh, you know all these celebrities, I don't care. These celebrities are not what gets the message out. People get the message out. They share it with their friends. They share it with people. Celebrities, they're sitting back, want to keep everything to themselves, and they're, they have insecurities. When I have friends who are celebrities, not all celebrities, but a great portion of the ones that I've met have this insecurity of, are you outshining me? Are you, are you, are, are, if I introduce you to this friend of mine who's also a celebrity, are you going to become friends with them over me? They get really into this insecurity. I'm not into it. I'm not going to chase you. I had this conversation with um, Diego, young Pueblo. We were sitting in Miami. I said, you know what I love about you, Diego? I said, because you keep it real, brother. I said, the root, the, the, here's, the, here's the truth of the truth. We do as we do. We don't chase. We don't fight. We don't kick down doors. We just keep doing what we're doing, and those who need to come will come. We are not here to lift ourselves on a pedestal greater than other people because then it takes us away from our message. People who do that, it's because they're using that as a platform to make themselves feel better. I am one of the people. If I far remove myself and put myself on a platform, I know there are people who will do that. In Turkey, I have people to this day who have altars in their home with my picture with flowers that they replace every single day with my flowers. And I go to their home. They're like, look, at, we have this altar. My kid has one in their room and my daughter has one in her room and you bring us all this love. We feel all this success come in our life because of you. I said, look, I said, don't have me pull down my pants right now and take a shit because I'll show you I'm human being. <laughs> okay? I don't play. Okay? Take that altar down. 
Okay, you, you, you don't need to be putting up altars on me. I'm not into it. I'm not into it. I'm not into this higher, higher than holier than thou. I'm better than you because I'm not. I shit. I bleed. I, I, I get funky if I don't take a shower. I, get, I, I have real emotions. I cry. I, I get insecure. I go through everything. And there's not one person on this planet that doesn't go through the same thing. If you have a, a biological spacesuit, you are in it with us. There's no, I don't care if you, I said this very clearly to a bunch of friends of mine. I said, they said, well, you know, you're friends with this person and that celebrity and that person. I said, they would never be in my camp if we all of a sudden lost electricity and all this kind of stuff. Because if you don't know how to build uh, a garden and know how to, to turn um, water from ocean water into drinking water, and you don't know how to hunt, and you don't know how to do what you need to do to keep our tribe alive, you, you're going to sing me to sleep, Beyonce? It's not going to work. <laughs> You better have some other skills. If these mics weren't so expensive, I'd ask you to drop yours right now. There we go. Shaman Dirk, we've done it, man. We've done it. Two hours, 42 minutes, and 49 seconds. Wow, that's the longest podcast I've ever done. Yep. I think I, I think I think I've done one longer with uh, the biohacking millennial Matt Maruka. I think we did three. But there's, you know, there's a, there's so much more too. But I, I feel I've accomplished what I wanted to accomplish, what I wanted to extract from your wisdom and experience. And dude, I just love you. You know, I, I wanted to say this in the beginning, I didn't get around to it, but we're just getting to know each other. We're recent friends through mutual friends and events and things like that. But one thing that's really cool about you is uh, is that you just text me and check in and you just say, hey, I love you, bro. I'm, I'm thinking about you. You've been on my mind, you know, and it's like, I have friends that we don't even do that for each other. And I've known their ass for a long time, you know? So it's just, you're someone I really wanted to sit down and spend some quality time with. And I was hesitant to even say, Hey, let's, let's turn our play date into uh, a fucking content or like doing this is work kind of too. You know, I got all these, this equipment and all this stuff. And I was like, ah, maybe we should just hang out. And I said, dude, this is the conversation we would have been having anyway. Without the stuff, exactly. When I you mean, I would have me butted that. in a bit more than I did, you know, in this, in the context of this. But it's like, these are the conversations I think that really benefit people. So not only is it enjoyable for me just to get to know you deeper and, uh, and on a deeper level, but to be able to share that, that getting to know you with other people. So... Yeah, you know, it's interesting because when I got your, you know, my whole thing was um, I wanted to just have a geek out, hang out with you. I love being around you. I want to do like shaman, shamanic stuff. I want to check out your gadgets and like just have fun and just like be bros, you know, have like our bro time. And so literally when you sent me the message, you're like, oh, yeah, we can like, you know, like do this and do the podcast and, you know, and stuff. And I, you know, my what came up to me immediately was like, you know, that's okay if he wants to do that because it's the same thing. It's just he's just recording what we would be doing anyway. <laughs> yeah. you we know? just can't move around. Right, because you know? we won't be able to, like, you know, <laughs> show that aspect. But yeah. honestly, you know, for me, uh, being in your life um, – when I, when I call someone a friend, when I'm in their life, I may not be able to call them every single day because I do lead, lead a very busy life. But I, my, I'm the type of person where if I don't see you for maybe a year – like I have friends who I don't see for like a year – in that year time, I'll check in, whatever. Maybe we don't get together, but you're st once I call you a friend, you're a friend, and you stay a friend. And you could leave seven years and come back, and we was it'll it'll be like the day we 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 separated. The the last thing we did, it takes off from that moment. And for me, I I really connected with you the first time I met you. I really found you to be a very um playful, fun with your gadgets. I remember you put some heating thing on me, and you did some kind of oxygen thing, and like. <laughs> I was like, whoa, what is all this stuff? You know, it's very fascinating to me because I deal with the world of like magic and spirit and energy and, you know, all this kind of stuff. So to see these kind of gadgets and it's fun, it's fun for me, you know, but that wasn't the only reason why I enjoyed you. What I enjoyed about you was your dope ass realness, you know, and when I look for tribe, I look for my tribe to be straight up real. Like, yeah, I drank. Yeah, I did drugs. Like, whatever. And next, you know, and not like trying to like be something, because I'll meet people in the spirit world, you know, I was just talking about it with Sahara Rose today, like me, why me and her are friends, because we're just dope ass real with each other. Like we don't, we don't play games. We don't mince words. We're just like, this is how it is. And that's how it is. And that's how we talk and blah, 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 blah. And we have fun together and we don't care. And I, that's the kind of people that I choose to make my social engagements with when I take time outside of my work where I want to spend time with someone. That's the type of person that I look for. And you represent that. And so for me, 
being coming over and just geeking out with you. I love geek outs. Like another person that I don't know if you've ever had on your podcast, which would be really great, um, is my friend Paul Hawken. You know, and it's like when Paul, we were at Mind Body Green, and people just like bow down to Paul. You know, because he's like this amazing scientist and wrote this book, Drawdown, and he did. He took like 250 scientists and you know figured out why do we have global warming and like did the math and like not the math, not hype, not like assumptions, but like the math to figure out like what is the problem. Everyone just like bows down to him. I was like, hey, Paul, let's go to my room and geek out. And he's like, I'm there. You know, came to my room, geeked out, put him on my podcast. He had some, such a great time. He's like, I want you to come to my house. I want to hang out with you. Let's be friends. You know, it's like because all of that other shit that people like put so much attention on goes back to the whole idea of this kind of like this love and like idea that people need to feel loved and like instead of just choosing to be just straight up real and just have fun and enjoy life. And so, yeah, I really appreciate you. And I honestly feel like our relationship, our connection supersedes the time frame that we met. I honestly feel that I've had other experiences with your energy and your essence. And that's one of the reasons why, and I love you, man. Like when I, when I write you and I tell you, like, I love you, like I love you and I enjoy you. I appreciate you. I honor you. I see you. I love what you're doing. I want to support you any way I can. And that's what I'm about. And, and I, I was talking about it with Sahara today. I said, you know, there's people who will talk shit behind my back. I cut them immediately because I have so many people that are valuable to me. I don't need people who can't honor the value that I bring into their life and vice versa. Yeah. Right on, dude. <laughs> Amen, <laughs> brother. Well, thank you. And thank you for humoring me on my desire to uh, document our hanging out, too. I appreciate it. It's been it's fun. totally I'm, fine. I'm sure that people are going to really benefit from this conversation. So thank you. Until next time. Absolutely. Absolutely.